Okay, we're going to, to, to start slowly. Welcome back. Uh, this afternoon, we, we are going to try to, to uh, present what we need to do turbulent flames, which really means we're going to talk about laminar flames first. Many of the things uh, I will present look a little bit like what Moshe did this morning, except he did it in a, I would say, in the mathematician way, and I will do it more in a, I hope, in an easy way for you. Um, but we're going to talk about the same thing. And if you want to have the, the complete story, uh, if you're interested in that, you have to read Moshe's paper. Mine are simpler and somehow less powerful, I would say, but easier to understand. So we want to do two flames this afternoon, I hope, the premix laminar flame and uh, the diffusion flame. So let me start with the premix flame. Uh, as I told you yesterday, it's good to have the equations, but now we have to try to understand how these uh, conservation equations behave. To do that, we're going to look at a few canonical flames, which really means flames for which we hope we can have a solution. One of the most famous uh, examples of such solutions is the 1D laminar premix flame. You can do it at home. We used to do it in the lab uh, with students. Just take a tube, fill it with air and gas, you mix, and then you ignite one end. You will have a flame propagating from one side to the other. Actually, I see I don't have a pointer here. Uh, yeah, this one's going to be weak. If you have a, say, uh, an additional pointer, I'm interested. So the, the flame will propagate from the right to the left here. Where does it lie? I don't see it. Oh, here. It's hidden here. Thanks. So this flame will move from the right to the left, OK? The interesting thing that we, we know uh, when you did the experiment is that after a while, it will start propagating at a constant speed, okay? which tells you right away that there must be some kind of configuration where this thing should be on, where uh, this interface here is moving at a constant speed from right to left, which was not obvious, OK? Actually, in the real world, it's difficult to do. Uh, but for us to understand those flames, we can start here by saying that uh, in this configuration, if this front remains planar, it will move ultimately at a constant speed, and we call that the unstretched laminar flame speed, okay? which is really the basic quantity. You will see that we use this quantity for many things, including for chemistry, for example, to verify chemical schemes. Uh, now, it means also that if you now sit on the flame front, on the reference frame of the flame front, since it's moving at a constant speed, you can do that, okay? It's a, it's a valid reference frame, and that means that in this flame front, the flame is not moving, okay? It's a steady problem. It's a steady problem as if you would be sitting on top of a train, okay? So if you sit on top of the train at the speed of the train, now the wind is coming towards you at the train speed, which means that when we're going to work here on this flame, the flow speed of the air here would be equal to the flame speed. And that will make our life easier because it will be a 1D problem. So in our conservation equations, it makes things simpler. And a steady problem, no time dependence. So right away, you see why people started looking at that. It's because they thought that they could solve the problem. And that's the, the, the resolution that we are going to do. I just want to show you the results before we start. Uh, the fuel mass fraction will look like this. So there is fuel in front of the flame. There is no fuel behind the flame. For a lean flame, everything will burn. The heat release will peak here somewhere, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And the temperature will go up from 300K to maybe 2,000. 2,300 depends on the case, OK? So what we are trying to understand now is, can we predict that without using a code? OK? You can do it with a code, of course. If you go to, uh, to, uh, to the web, you can find a lot of codes which can do that. So they solve in the reference frame of the flame the equations, which are conservation of mass, rho u equal constant. So it's equal to the inlet quantity, rho 1. That's the density of the fresh gases mixed with uh, fuel multiplied by the flame speed. Because as I told you, at the inlet of this domain, the flow speed must be equal to the flame speed. Otherwise, the flame will go away. And then you have the conservation equation for each species. And there can be a lot of species. And then you have the temperature equation that you wrote yesterday without d dt over dt, OK? 
This set of equations can be solved by many codes. You just ask for it and they will give you the result. But that's not what I want to do. I want you to see that you can also solve it by hand to understand the structure of the, of the, of the frame. So this is a typical example actually of one of these codes for uh, uh, H2O2 flame. I picked up H2O2 because it's quite different from others. You know, this is the flame which goes probably the fastest, about three meters per second. Uh, most other flames don't go more than 50 centimeters per second. Uh, it's also very hot. You go to 3000 K or even more. And uh, if you look at this number here, this is the heat release, okay? This is not SI. If you would go to international units, it would be something like 10 to the power 9 to 10 to the power 10. But it's enormous, okay? You have to know when you look at the simulation of a flame, how much should be the reaction rate. The reaction rate controls everything, okay? Don't look at temperature, I mean, it's easy. Look at reaction rate, you have to know what is the typical order of magnitude of reaction rate, and this is always an enormous number. For example, you know, I, mean, I see many students coming to me saying I have a reaction rate of 5 to 10 to the power 6, it means the flame is quenched, okay, it's gone. If it, it, the reaction rates, the heat release here, must be very high, and in H2, H2O2 flame is actually of the order of 10 to the power 10. So now we need, if you want to do that, what I'm going to do in the next 15 minutes is what Moshe did this morning too, is I want to bring those equations back to me where I can solve them, because there are just too many of them. And this can be done by using a few simplifications. The first one is to say that we have a single reaction, fuel plus oxidizer goes to product, and we use a second assumption. We say that this uh, reaction is occurring in a lean flame. That means that in this equation here, where I have Y fuel, Y O, there's a lot of oxygen. There is so much oxygen that actually I can uh, forget about it and just write this thing as if Y O would be constant. So I just say A prime, equal A for multiplied by Y O, and I have one constant. So that now you see right away, in one page, I have eliminated all the species to keep only the fuel. All the other species, I don't need to care about them. They will all be deduced from that. So, of course, for me, it's going to be much easier if I'm looking for an analytical solution. So instead of n mass fractions here, we just need to uh, track YF, the fuel concentration. Now, that means that the equations of conservation become flow rate equal constant, one equation for the fuel, with here D, the diffusion coefficient of the fuel, which will be very high if it's hydrogen, for example, and which will be lower for hydrocarbons, and here one equation for the temperature. Here, you see that uh, you have the heat, the, the fuel consumption, this number is negative, fuel is consumed, obviously, and here you have minus Q multiplied by omega dot F, that's the heat release. Q is the heat release when one kilogram of fuel burns, okay? So this number here is, of course, positive. Omega dot F is negative. This number is the one which must be of the order of 10 to the power 9 or 10. So when the theoreticians saw these equations, and you had, you had a good example this morning, it makes them a little bit crazy, you know? So they start writing all kinds of big equations to try to solve that. I'm going to go faster to the, to the solution, because you can do that in uh, using a few assumptions. Um, the first thing uh, uh, I want to do here is uh, to take these two equations here and integrate them between one side of the flame font and the other side of the flame font. And if you do that, you know, uh, here this is a constant, so when you integrate the derivative, you find just a function. So it's Y fuel in one side of the flame minus Y fuel on the other side. Since the flame is lean, Y F2 equals zero. I'm only left with this term, and on the right-hand side, these terms go away. Why do they go away? Because rho d gradient of y fuel is zero far away upstream of the flame because y fuel is one, and it is zero downstream of the flame because y fuel is zero. So this term, when we integrate, is zero. And so you are left with a simple equation which tells you that uh, this term is equal to the integral of the reaction rate. Integral of omega dot f dx is really what's important to you. It tells you how much fuel is burned the total per second in this flame. You do the same thing for the second equation and you get the same result. Here I'm assuming Cp equal constant. Remember yesterday we, we, we said that for most uh, premix flames this was a good assumption. So rho Cp SL comes out of the integral. I'm left with the integral of dt dx dx, which is t. 
So this is OSLCP T2 minus T1. That's the temperature difference between cold and burnt, equal, again, to minus Q multiplied by the total uh, fuel consumption rate. Now, this equation uh, are, are uh, uh, quite useful to, to understand a little bit what the premixed flame is doing. The first thing you recognize here, if you have done fluid mechanics, is that this is a flow rate, okay? A density multiplied by a speed is a flow rate, and if you multiply it by the fuel mass fraction, this is actually nothing else than the mass fraction of fuel per square meter, okay? And obviously, in a steady flame, it must be equal to everything which burns in the flame, because this is uh, in the reference frame of the flame. Everything entering the flame has to disappear in the flame. So this is what this equation is telling us, is that all the fuel entering our box burns in the box. And then you see that once it has burned, it has generated this heat here, minus Q multiplied by this guy. And where does this heat goes? go? Well, it goes into the gas. This is what creates the increase of temperature. So if you eliminate the total reaction rate between these two equations, we find that the, the Cp T2 minus T1 equal Q Y F1. That's the baseline equation for the adiabatic flame temperature. The elevation of temperature is due to the, uh, the fuel which is burned. And that's also showing you that there is, in those flames, you are exchanging fuel with its Q value for heat, okay? So this is what's happening between the two sides. Now, you can do more than that when you have these equations. You can have, a, I would say, a simple interpretation of what's going on here. Again, you have a fuel mass flux entering this flame front. Now, this creates heat, and the heat creates the heat release and the temperature elevation of the gas. Now, I'm not going to be as violent uh, as Moshe, where you saw this morning that after 10 minutes you were swimming in a sci fi space. I'm going to try to keep reasonable things. Uh, so I'm, I'll keep the temperature will still be theta, and it is the reduced temperature, T minus the fresh gases divided by the burn minus the fresh. So this thing goes from zero in the cold gas to one in the burnt. And the fuel mass fraction, I'm normalizing it by the inlet mass fraction so that it goes from one to zero. Okay. Now, um, those of you who are used to that know where I want to go. You know, I don't like the idea of having two variables. I'd like to have only one. So um, um, these variables, you know, look like they could be combined. Maybe they're not independent. Uh, so how can we do that? You take the first equation here and you divide it by YF1. You take the second one, you divide it by CPT2 minus T1, and then you sum the two equations. And you see that this variable Y plus theta is actually a variable which has an equation saying DDX equal DDX of lambda DDX. I've used one assumption to do that. I have said that the Lewis number of the fuel was equal to unity. You see here, I've said that uh, Rho D was equal to lambda over Cp. That means the Lewis number is equal to unity. So that now that these two things, heat and species, diffuse in the same way, they are actually the same variable. Because you see that Y plus theta here is a variable which goes from one in the fresh to one in the burnt. So what is the solution of an equation like this, which goes from one to one? It's an exponential, okay? You recognize this is F prime equal K F double prime. And the only way to go from one to one if you're an exponential is to be constant. Okay, so clearly, the only solution to this problem is that y plus theta must be equal to unity. Which means that in this flame, with Lewis equal unity, and again, Moshe this morning was more ambitious than I am, he considered the case where Lewis can be anything. I don't want to go that far for the moment. I'm saying that uh, the, the Lewis number is unity, so these two variables are not independent. Either you are hot and you have no fuel left, or you are cold and you have fuel left. In, and in between, the sum of the two, theta plus y, must be equal to unity. So it's like a conservation of total energy, if you want. You are either in temperature or you are in the fuel. Which means also that since there is a link between these two variables, I can keep only one. I will decide to keep only temperature. And everywhere I see y, the fuel mass fraction, I will replace it by one minus theta. Which really means that I can keep only one equation now. And you see, you see I'm start, I've started from the full navier stokes equations. Now I have one ODE. Not easy to solve, but it's already easier. And this ODE is written like this. D theta dx, 
the diffusion term and here the heat release. Now this equation is the equation which was solved this morning by Moshe and uh, uh, I don't want to repeat what is done, I'm going to do an alternative solution. To do that, we need to look at this ODE. It's not such an easy equation to solve, okay? If there would be no term here, this term is the problem. I mean, this one is easy to integrate. You know it's an exponential solution. This one is painful. So this is where the, 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 the theoreticians uh, started uh, working a century ago. They said, let's try to solve this equation. If you want to solve this equation, you need first to look at the source term here, which is the right-hand side. And uh, you use the equation rho t equal constant because it's a deflagration, pressure is constant. So rho t is constant, you plug it here, you end up with this expression, okay? The reaction rate goes to zero when theta goes to one. When everything is burnt, it's finished. And when the temperature is too low, this term here, which is the exponential, brings you also to zero. So this is really the baseline equation for all of uh, us doing asymptotics. I just want to remind you that to go there, we had to assume pressure to be constant, single reaction, unity Lewis number, adiabatic flow. This morning, again, Moshe, Moshe is, you know, it's his job, he does that all the time. He went also for the non-adiabatic case. I think you have to first understand the adiabatic case. It's, it's already complicated enough. So the first thing you do if you need to solve this equation is that you plot this term as a function of theta. Here you get the fresh gases, no reaction rate, it's too cold. Here you get the burned gases, no reaction rate, there is no fuel left. Everything's burned. So one minus theta goes to zero. And in the middle, you get this shape. And you see that this is the first characteristic of combustion, which says when it's cold, you have no problem. You know, all this zone here, no reaction rate. In this room, we could have a theta of 0.4, nothing would happen. You have to go to higher values of theta. You can actually take this expression and look for the value of theta where this term has a maximum. And you will find, it's actually you can do it by hand, you find that this is a critical temperature, one minus one over alpha plus beta. So uh, alpha and beta are terms which uh, I need to uh, describe now. Alpha and beta, if you read Williams, uh, Linian, all the big guys, they always use the same numbers. Uh, because those are physical numbers which are important. Uh, alpha is T2 minus T1 over T2. So that's the temperature elevation divided by the burn gas temperature. And beta measures the activation temperature. Beta is a big number, typically 10. And alpha is a number of the order of 0.9 to 2.8. So the maximum here is 1 over 1 alpha plus beta, which is of the order of 1 minus 1 over beta. So, and this is a number, if beta equal 10, which is of the order of 0.9, which really means that if you take a flame where the adiabatic temperature is 2200K, the maximum reaction rate takes place at 1900, very close to the uh, highest temperature you can reach. All the combustion occurs at the last moment, very close to the burn gases condition. So that means really that um, uh, we're going to be able now to, to, to talk about this match asymptotics method. Those are, I mentioned that yesterday, if you compute an aircraft, you know, you talk about the boundary layer, far from the plane, no viscosity, and in the boundary layer, there are viscous effects. It's the same for combustion. In the flame, there's a big zone here, which is a little bit like the earlier conditions for an aircraft, where nothing happens. There is no combustion here. And then very close here to the burn gases, there is suddenly a reaction zone. We call that the preheat zone, and we call this one the reaction zone. And the whole question, once you see that, is that you can exploit this property to solve the problem. So now I'm, go I'm going to give credit here to a, a, one of my friends, Echeki here. Tarek Echeki is, is, maybe some of you are working with him, he's a professor in the States. Tarek had to solve this problem like 30 years ago, and Tarek had a big quality. He was lazy. He, he told me, I don't want it, the exponential is too complicated. The important thing in this problem, he told me, the important thing is that you get combustion in two parts, nothing, and then suddenly a lot, okay? And the a lot goes to a lot to zero here. But I don't want to deal with the exponential. Let's take a linear function, because he knew that if you take a linear function, you can solve it by hand, okay? The exponential solution will work. So he said, I'm going to replace this exponential shape by the wet curve up to one minus one over beta, I have zero reaction rate, and then at this value of temperature, I have a big reaction rate which goes to zero 
at C to equal one. This is very close to uh, the real flame behavior, but it doesn't have all this uh, exponential uh, which are a pain to, 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 to solve for. So I'm going to show you the resolution of a flame with the model of uh, Echeki. And you will see that it's, it's much easier than the solution of Moshe because I have simplified the problem. So in the preheating zone, I will set reaction rate to zero, and in the reaction zone, I will, lose, I will use a linear heat release, not an exponential one. So it's an elegant method to do that, and you can find actually expansions and extensions of that. And uh, the theoreticians don't like it too much, but I think it's nice because you can do it in five minutes. If you want to do it with full Arrhenius chemistry, then you go back to, to, to Moshe, and I, of course, he has the exact solution. So let me, let me do it first by looking at this zone here. That's an easy zone, okay, because it's only this term equal to that one, and there is no reaction rate. So this thing you can integrate easily, okay? You know that temperature must go to zero here, and it must go to theta critical when x equals zero. So you just uh, integrate this equation, all these are constants, so you find that the temperature can be written theta critical exponential x over delta, where x is the space variable from the flame to minus infinity. And right away, you see that something appears here, delta. Delta, when you resolve this equation, is the ratio of the diffusivity in the fresh gases, that's lambda over rho Cp, divided by the flame speed. So right away, you see something. You see that there is a thickness associated to the flame, and that this thickness is controlled by the diffusivity of heat in the fresh gases, which is close to the diffusivity of uh, fuel, because we said that the Lewis number was unity, divided by the flame speed. Okay. Uh, right away, it tells you that if a flame is fast, it's going to be thin, vice versa. And right away, it's telling you that what controls the thickness of uh, deflagration is a mixture of two things, the flame speed and the diffusivity. If you do the same thing for detonation, there will be no diffusivity. Diffusivity doesn't play any role in a detonation. But in a deflagration, it's a very important quantity. So this is for the preheating zone. Now, let me go into the reaction zone now. What do you do in the reaction zone? You have to keep this term. Rho 1 R, 1 minus theta R, is a little bit like your pre-exponential constant. When R is big, it means chemistry is fast. When R is zero, there would be no chemistry. Now, to solve this equation with this boundary condition, we go from the flame front now to infinity. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's not such a big deal. You just have to recognize that it's going to be an exponential solution, so you can write it like this, a plus b exponential gamma x. And, uh, you know, if theta is written like this, its first derivative with, will be minus b gamma exponential gamma x, and the second derivative will be minus b gamma square exponential gamma x. You replace that and that into this equation, you obtain this one, you can simplify the b, the gamma, the exponential gamma x, you are left with a second order equation. Minus b plus or minus square root of b square minus 4ac divided by 2a. Remember that? It's a long time ago. Huh? So this equation has a root for gamma, so you compute it, and the result is written here, and it is gamma equal that where I've used delta here in this expression. Uh, of course, there are two roots. Uh, I take the negative one, because the temperature will go to infinity. I don't, want, I don't want this root. So you see that now, in the reaction zone, I know exactly the shape of the temperature. So I have solved almost everything. I know the shape of the temperature in the preheat zone. And I have also found the temperature in the reaction zone. So you could say, I'm done, okay? But there's a trick here that I didn't tell you, uh, and that's the following. What's the flame speed? From day one, when we started this demo, I told you, let's sit in the reference frame of the flame. But you don't know what the flame speed is for the moment. And uh, so that means we haven't finished the problem yet. I've said that we, we use SL, but we don't know SL yet. So, and that's a classical problem. Actually, Moshe mentioned it also this morning. The flame speed is actually an eigenvalue of this problem. And you need to find it. Otherwise, you have not finished your problem. So that really means that if you do a, a analytical computation, you will know the gas, and you will know the chemistry, 
How do you find the flame speed? Well, you need to do something I haven't done yet. You need to connect the two solutions in the preheat zone and in the reaction zone. They are not connected fully for the moment. Uh, they are continuous for temperature, but they are not necessarily continuous for heat release, or let's say for, for temperature gradient. You see, this is a solution in the fresh gases in the preheat zone, and this is a solution in the reaction zone. And here you see that you wouldn't like this solution because the gradient of temperature is not continuous. So the heat flux is not continuous, it's not a physical solution. And when you change the SL, these two curves move, and there's only one SL for which these two curves are actually continuous for the derivative. So if you just write that the temperature gradient on the left side of the flame in the preheat zone is equal to the temperature gradient on the right side of the flame in the reaction zone, you are able to find that there's only one speed which gives you that, and in the speed which is written here. SL equal square root of uh, D multiplied by R normalized by beta here. And that's the missing part. Once you know that, then you have the full solution of your, pr of your problem. So that means at that point, you can construct the solution now. And you see on this plot, actually, an analytical solution compared to the numerical, to the theoretical solution. And you see that they match extremely well. So this method works. I mean, you can do it with a computer, but by hand, it would give you right away the right result. So to summarize, the only thing you need to know if you don't want to spend your life uh, working on asymptotics uh, is that a premix flame has a thickness proportional to the diffusivity of heat in the fresh gases. You know, it's typically 1.6, 10 to the minus 5. It's not much. Huh? Divided by the flame speed. Okay. Uh, note that if you don't remember this expression, it means that delta multiplied by SL divided by D equal 1. The Reynolds number of the flame is equal to unity. Okay. Uh, and uh, the, it has also a speed. And the speed is given by this expression. And I will come back to that in a second. You will see that Moshe and I don't get to the same conclusions here. Um, you will see that this has very important consequences for codes. So I did this demo by assuming the Echecki formulation, but you can do it with many other expressions. Moshe has shown you one. And depending on what you do, you don't obtain the same flame speed. But they all look the same. In all expressions here on the right-hand side, you will find a diffusivity multiplied by a chemical constant to the power one half. Okay, all of them give you the same, the same result. And that's something that you, you need to, to remember. Also, a few students come to me often, they are surpri surprised. You do a computation with Cantera, and the flame speed is one meter per second. And you multiply the pre-exponential constant by two, and you think it's going to go two times faster. No, it's going to go square root of two times faster, because here you get a one half. Okay? And again, COE works. I mean, if you, can, you, can do, you can try it in Cortera, you will see it works extremely well. So uh, the other thing you see is that when the flame moves, it's not only because of chemistry, it's because of diffusivity. And if you get the wrong model in your code for diffusivity, you will get the, the wrong flame speed. So you see that COE here, uh, is quite useful. It tells you a lot of things on how the flame behaves. And of course, as I told you, it shows that diffusivity is important for deflagration. If you would do the same thing for detonation, you would find that diffusivity doesn't play any role for a detonation. And it tells you also that if you want to write a code, you should not only take care of chemistry, you should also take care of diffusion, which is a completely different problem. So, by the way, you can also have a feeling uh, on how a premix flame moves, which is quite a strange thing if you think about it. I told you that when things are cold, you cannot burn them. So how does the flame make progress? Well, the flame does a strange thing. If you sit at the, on the flame at the time t0, you see that the temperature profile is like this. Okay? And then something happens. Uh, diffusion takes place. If you have diffusion, you know what diffusion does to a profile like this one. Diffusion will heat up the gases in front of the flame, so that now there is a zone here of gases which are hot enough to burn. So if they burn, they will increase even more the temperature. So that now 
the profile which was there will have moved to here. And you see the role of diffusion and chemical reactions. You can imagine, if you want, that the first thing you need to do is to heat up those gases, and that's due to diffusivity, and the second thing is to burn. And it explains also why a premix flame cannot move without the combination of the two. You need to diffuse, and when it's, once it's hot enough, then it burns. And all of this must occur on 0.5 millimeter so that the flame can actually make progress. Now, at the end of the day, you see that it's a very complicated animal. And well, it works. Now, right away here, we're going to start talking about something else. When you see an expression like that, and you are a numerician, well, again, in numerical computations, you say, wow, this is 1.6 to 10 to the minus 5 divided by 0.3 meters per second. Uh, this is going to be a few microns, tens of microns. So we know that if we try to code these equations you know, directly, we're going to have a problem because everything will be too thin. But you see also something that uh, since this is the result of the flame speed, there's something you can guess from theory. And again, you will never find it out without theory. Is that you can do something here. You can multiply the diffusivity by a factor f, which we call the sickening factor. And you can divide the pre-exponential constant by the same factor f. And of course, if I do that, I get the same flame speed, OK? Because these two things go away. And you can check it. Again, you can take Cantera. You can multiply diffusivity by f, divide reaction weight by f, and you will see that the flame will move at the same speed. But now, what, what will happen to the thickness? Well, if you put an f in front of d, well, the thickness will be larger by a factor of f. So what have you done? You have built a model which allows the flame to propagate at the same speed, but to be thicker. Okay? And this second flame model actually today has become almost a standard in the community because it's quite convenient for many uh, uh, examples that we will see tomorrow. So that really means that uh, when you go to the second flame model, if you look at the equations, this is the exact equation for species. If you just multiply d by f here in this expression, and you divide a by f in this expression, you will have the same flame speed, but you will have a larger flame thickness. So just to give you an example, uh, this is a, a 1D flame that you could do with Cantera or uh, Kemkin. The black one is the initial flame. And you see that you would, if you would want to resolve it, it would be a pain. I mean, you would need a lot of points. And this one has been thickened by a factor of 20. Okay? And uh, it goes at the same speed, but it's much easier to resolve. And if you look at the reaction weight, instead of fighting like many PhD students do to put a lot of points here and then you get to crazy resolutions, well, you just resolve that one, okay? Much easier. And so this is what people do today in many, many codes. They second the flame font. You, don't lose, you lose things, I will describe tomorrow, but you have the capacity of propagating the flame exactly at the speed you want. Now, <clears throat> there's something, uh, 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 even Moshe did the same. Huh? We've been talking about flame speed, but if it is a speed, it should be a vector. Okay, the first thing, a speed is not a scalar, it's a vector. And the second thing is that there are many speeds. So we need to start talking about uh, speeds. Um, there are at least three speeds that we will describe now. The absolute flame speed, the displacement flame speed, and the consumption flame speed. And of course, in the literature, people will talk about the flame speed. And you will have to figure out which flame speed they are talking about. Um, so let me... Uh, start by saying that uh, the flame is moving at its own speed and the flow is moving at its own speed. And both of them can be in different directions. The flame can be moving in this direction at speed W, while the flow is moving in its direction at speed U. Okay? It's like when you cross a river with a boat. Okay? The river flows and you travel on the river. So defining what the velocity is here is a little bit complicated. It is even more complicated because the flame is a surface. So it's easy to define the speed of a point. Okay, if you take a point here and it travels here, you know what W is. But if you have an interface like this, you don't know where this point is going. The only thing you know is the, the normal velocity, the fact that at this instant you were here, 
and at this instant you were here. So you, the only meaningful flame speed has to be measured along the normal to the flame front. So how do you measure the normal? The normal is uh, the gradient of the temperature normalized by its uh, modulus. That gives you a vector uh, for uh, the flame, and that uh, will give you then W dot N will be what we call the absolute flame speed. So it's really, the absolute flame speed is really the speed at which you see a flame moving. If I would ignite a flame here, you would see it moving, so you would take the point here, you would divide by the time, it would give you the absolute flame speed. It depends on the reference frame in which you are sitting, okay? If you're moving with the flame or not. So that's the absolute flame speed. Uh, the point with the absolute flame speed, you know, is that uh, if you're on a boat and you're traveling uh, on a river, no one knows if you are fast or not. It depends on the river. Maybe the river is going fast and you're going slowly. So if you really want to characterize a flame, you have to go to the displacement flame speed. So the displacement flame speed tells you how fast the flame moves compared to the flow. So this time you have to take W minus U. And again, you cannot measure it in any direction. You have to measure it in the normal direction to the flame front. SD is really something you should avoid, believe me. It's a strange quantity. I will give you an example pretty soon. It's difficult to measure because you would need W and U at the same time. And again, uh, to pick up again my example, you know, if you have a boat on a river, it's easy to measure its speed. But if you want to measure its displacement speed, you have to know the speed of the boat and the speed of the water where the boat is. And in the combustion case, it, it's, it's really difficult. Very few groups today are able to do that. By the way, this is the speed that people use when you use the G equation. We talk about the G equation tomorrow. That's one method to uh, do turbulent combustion. And this is the speed you need when you do that. Uh, it's important to see that uh, the displacement and the speeds depend on the point where you measure them. And uh, when people talk about flame speeds, usually they define the ISO temperature of something and they look at the speed of that. Uh, it would be nice if you could do that in what Moshe called the thermodiffusive limitations, applications, you know, where density is constant. Unfortunately, in a flame, density changes so that the flow speed changes very rapidly so that the displacement speed becomes a very, uh, uh, let's say, counterintuitive uh, quantity to, 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 to define. So let me just take a first example. But that's very simple. That's a 1D laminar flame, okay? You all understand what this guy means. And uh, you know that uh, the absolute speed of this ISO temperature here, which may be C equal 0.1, and the flame speed of this one, which is maybe C equal 0.9, the absolute speed must be the same, okay? Because otherwise, this flame would get thicker or thinner. If, they move, if the flame remains like this over time, it's because the absolute speed of that one is equal to this one. So, fine for the absolute speed, but then since the flow speed is changing from here to there, the displacement speed must do funny things. So let's look at the displacement speed. We're going to take here uh, uh, an example of different premix flames, and we'll talk about uh, different isocontours. Let's say a cold isocontour, 0.01 for the reduced temperature, and a hot uh, isocontour. So let's look at uh, dis the displacement speed for a case like this. We're going to do that. Uh, uh, in a few minutes. Before I do that, I just want to, to finish the last speed I did not introduce, which is the consumption speed, which is the one I recommend to use, actually. Why do we talk about uh, a third speed based on consumption? Because this one is based on this type of integral here. If you take a laminar flame speed sitting here in the middle of the domain, you can integrate this equation from minus infinity to plus infinity. And like we did before, Many of these terms will cancel. This term here will be zero, and it will be zero here, and we will be left with an equation which looks like this. Rho 1 SL multiplied by the fuel mass fraction in the burnt, which is normally zero, minus the fuel mass fraction in the fresh, YF1, equal the integral of omega dot F. So I can write it like this. SL, or SC, that's why we call it the consumption speed, is equal to minus 1 over rho yf1 integral of omega dot fdn. 
So you see that we call it consumption because it measures the consumption. Okay, it's proportional to how much is burnt in the, the, the flame. It's independent of the frame of reference. The integral of the fuel mass fraction does not depend on the speed at which you measure this thing. It's, a, it's something which is independent. And you will see that it makes things much, much more convenient because it measures the integrated reaction rate. And again, there is a physical interpretation which is quite nice with the consumption speed. It's, it's a way to measure the reaction rate. Okay, you see that uh, the flux here of fuel is exactly what's burning inside the flame front. And uh, it's a good way to, to imagine uh, the, the flame speed. And again, it looks easy, but in two minutes, you're going to say, oh, that's not so easy. Uh, if you imagine that the flame is like a membrane, which is porous, and that there is a flow going through it, you see that the flow of fuel going through the flame front per square meter is rho 1, yf1, sc. That's the total mass of fuel flowing through the flame front which really means that if this is the total mass of fuel, you divide it by YF1, and you will have the total mass going through the flame front, and it is rho 1 as C. Okay. Quite easy. Okay. So if I have one square meter of flame, the amount of fuel going through, that means the amount of fuel burning through the flame front, is nothing else than rho 1 as C. Okay. But then there's a second property, is that this, this is true for any species. For example, if I want to know how much CO2 is leaving here, on this side. If I know the CO2 concentration here, the flux of CO2 which will go out will be rho 1 as C, why CO2? Not rho 2 as C, rho 1 as C, okay? This is where things get tricky. This is the total flux. You just have to multiply it by the CO2 mass fraction in the burn to have the CO2 flux. If you want H2O, you put H2O in the burn gases here and it will work. And you will see that we will use this property and that's a very easy way to, to interpret flame speeds compared to the displacement speed. So there is an extension that we will use for turbulent flame. If you have now not the flame which is planar, but the flame which is wrinkled, which has a total surface sigma, whatever the shape is, okay, we'll, we'll actually do that for many flames. And if you know the consumption speed along the surface SC, you know that the total reaction rate will be SC rho 1, yf0 multiplied by sigma. And that's, that's something that we will use everywhere for the flamelet models. For turbulent flames, sigma will increase because of turbulence. But if we believe in flamelet models, we still know that every square meter of flame will burn this uh, flux of, uh, of, uh, of fuel. Note that the, the consumption speed is a nice quantity, but in, if you're doing DNS, it's a painful quantity to measure because you have to travel and integrate things along the flame normal. So uh, sometimes it makes your life complicated. Uh, but uh, the, the, the nice thing about it is that it will not depend on the position where you are along the normal, while the displacement or the absolute speed will. So let me, let me show you that on a, on, on a plot here. This is an old DNS uh, of a premix flame. And, uh, if you go at this point here, you draw the normal to the flame front, you have one consumption speed. It's, the due, it's linked to the integral of the reaction rate here. So there will be one here, one here, one there, everywhere in the flame front, but there is only one at each position. While if you try to do DNS of the displacement speed, and now you ask yourself, what is the displacement speed along the normal? It will depend where you are. The displacement speed here will not be the same as the displacement speed here or here. And so that's painful because when you travel from one side of the flame front to the other side, uh, you don't find the same displacement flame speed. So you don't know which one you should take. So we're going to study a few cases so that you have a, a feeling uh, for, for, for what the, the, the flame speeds are actually doing. So the first thing we're going to do is to take a flame in a frame of reference which does not move, and we will ignite the flame so that it propagates towards the wall. So that's a tube with fresh gases, and I ignite it at this side, and then the flame then moves left. Okay, Very simple case. So I'm going to assume that I know the consumption speed, and I want to compute the others. So you just take 
the fuel equation and you integrate it between the wall here and the burn gases which are here. So when you do that, you see that uh, you have here the mass of fuel which is left plus the fluxes. There is no flux of fuel at the wall because it's a wall. And uh, at XB here, there is uh, uh, no flux either. So you multiply this one here. The two diffusion fluxes are zero and you are left here with the integral of the reaction rate, which is equal to, by definition, minus rho one yf one sc And if you just plug out things from that, you find, of course, of course, for the moment, in a minute you will see it's not always clear, that the position of the flame from dxf dt equal minus sc. Okay, what did you expect? Okay, you have a, a flame propagating left at 50 centimeters per second, so the flame front will move left at 50 centimeters per second. And again, be careful, because for the moment it seems simple, but in a minute you will tell me, oh, uh, well, that's strange. What is the flow speed? And that's also uh, an interesting thing. We can compute the flow speed in a flame like this. How do we do that? Well, we do just a balance of the total mass on a domain which is written here from zero to x here. So the total mass is rho one xf plus rho two xb minus xf. And xf is moving because the flame is going left. And the mass changes because there is a flux coming out here. What is this flux? It's minus rho two, the density of the burn, multiplied by u, the velocity of the, of the burn gases. And so if you combine m into this equation, you use this equation here, you find that u, the velocity of the burn gases, is rho 1 over rho 2 minus 1 multiplied by sc. So if a flame is moving left at 1 meter per second, the burn gases are moving right at 7 minus 1 meter per second, 6 meter per second. So there is a blast behind the flame. The, the, the burn gases are evacuated at high speed which, you know, probably is an intuitive result. Now, what is the displacement speed for this flame? Now things get tricky. To know the displacement speed, we need to know the flame speed and to subtract the flow speed. So when you do that, you know that uh, the W dot N everywhere is equal to SC because all the isocontours travel at the same speed. So the question really is, what, what is U? Well, we, U, we just computed it. We know it's rho 1 over rho 2 minus 1 SC. So when you compute SD, you find rho 1 over rho SC. It depends on rho, it depends on where you are, and it's not equal to SC. So you see that the displacement speed in a case like this is absolutely not constant. And when you plot it, this is what you find. You see that the displacement speed is the black line. The absolute speed is constant, it's the one we computed. And you see that uh, the displacement speed goes from one times SL0 to six times SL0. So it's not constant. If you measure the displacement speed here in a flame, you will have much less than if you measure it here. But remember, there's only 0.5 millimeter between the two. So if you do an experiment with PIV, for example, it will be extremely difficult to know where you are and uh, what, what the displacement speed should be. This is why I recommend to try not using SD. So let me do a second case now where the flame now is sitting in your reference frame. So you don't move, you move with the flame front, so the flame front doesn't move for you, so the absolute speed of the front is zero, okay? That's the simplest case. That's the one you use when you do a Cantera simulation. You are in the reference frame of the flame. What is the flow speed? Well, here we know that the conservation of mass tells us that uh, at each point, rho u must be equal to rho one SL zero, so that we know that the flow speed goes from rho 1 over rho to SL0 to uh, SL0. So it's SL0 at the inlet, and it's increasing in the flame front. So that when we compute the displacement speed, this is what we find. The displacement speed of one ISO level is going from SL0 to, you know, again, six or seven times SL0. So again, if you want to compute the displacement speed here, it will be difficult. Now, let me take the third example, which is probably uh, the, the one which has the, the, the largest number of consequences. Now, let's ignite a flame with a wall, but the other way. That means we have the wall, we ignite the flame here, and now the flame propagates away from the wall. So, when you do that, 
The consumption speed, as I said before, is always the same. We all say it's the same flame, so it burns the same amount of fuel. What is the speed of this point here? Okay. How do I find that? Well, there's an easy way to do that, is to do mass conservation of the CO2 which is here. Everything which is red is full of CO2, okay? I can compute the mass of CO2 here. It is the volume of this thing, which is XF multiplied by Rho2, Y CO2. How much of this CO2 is produced every second? We know that because we know the consumption speed. We know that at every instant, the mass of CO2 is produced by a flame front which has this surface here and which has a total flux of Rho 1 SC multiplied by Y CO2. You plug this one into this other one and you find that the absolute speed of this point is not equal to SC. It's equal to SC multiplied by Rho 1 over Rho 2. Which means that this point, if the flame speed is one meter per second, and you do the experiment you know, at home, and uh, you will see that this point does not move at one meter per second, but at seven meters per second. Okay. And you see, by the way, that uh, um, you shouldn't trust uh, the absolute flame speed or the displacement flame speed to, to, to see if a flame is fast or not. Why is it so? It's because of dilatation. You see, the big problem here is that when I burn a little bit of fresh gases, their density goes down by a factor of seven. How do I account for that? I don't pressurize, okay? It's a deflagration. If pressure doesn't go up, I need to push all the other gases away from me. So every time something burns here, it's pushing away the fresh gases. And that's now an interesting effect. It's a blast effect, but in the other way. If you're sitting here, you are pushed away by the flame before the flame arrives. Okay. Long before the flame will touch you, you will feel that here the flow is pushing you away. So we can compute actually the, the flow speed in the fresh gases completely with the same equation of conservation. And when we do that, we found that the flow speed here is rho 1 over rho 2 minus 1 multiplied by SC. In other words, the fresh gases move away before the flame arrives. Okay. And this has enormous consequences. By the way, if you want compu to compute the flame speed, again, the displacement flame speed, you will find that uh, it's, it's changing all the time and uh, that there's not much interest for us here. So what about the complications? Here we need to say a word about something we mentioned already, which is the self-acceleration of flames. Since the flames are pushing away the fresh gases in front of them, these fresh gases are moving away. If there are obstacles, they can start making vortices. They can even start making turbulence. So that when the flame now will reach these zones, it will accelerate again and push more fresh gases away. So that this thing will lead to a self-acceleration of flame. You can start from a flame at 30 centimeters per second and finish at two kilometers per second. In other words, if you have the choice tomorrow and you need to ignite a flame, don't ignite it near a wall, okay? Ignite it so that the flame goes to the wall, not away from the wall. This situation is uh, much uh, less dangerous. So uh, an example of simulation, this, is a, this one is a big one. I think this is two billion point simulation of a box where we do what we shouldn't do. That means there's a wall here, there are walls on the side and we ignite a flame here and there are obstacles. And you will see that when the flame grows, initially it's a laminar flame, very quiet, very small. It's pushing away the gases because of this effect. It's pushing away the fresh gases. And so when the flame then will reach this vorticity zone, it will accelerate and the system is self-amplifying. And this is what would lead ultimately to detonation. This one does not detonate, but as you will see, it's increasing in speed quite, quite a lot. So you see here the flame front and on this plane you see a projection of the flame front. You will see blue zones here, those are vorticity zones. You see the flame is here, but there's already vorticity here. Again, because of this blast effect. Now when the flame reaches the zones of vorticity, it gets more and more wrinkled and it accelerates. And the acceleration is extremely strong, extremely fast. And uh, as I said, at the end of this simulation, the flame was going about 100 meters per second. If the tube would have been longer, it would have gone sonic and then it would lead to detonation. And this process is due to dilatation. If there, would be, if there were no dilatation, we wouldn't have any problem. And it's a strange effect where the flame influences the flow long, uh, a long, a long distance compared to the place where it is. Okay? If you would sit here, you would already feel the wind. 
Okay, now you will feel, oh, this is accelerating. Long before the flame reaches you, you will already sense it. That's due to dilatation. So to compute, to conclude on this uh, business of, uh, of uh, laminar flames, uh, I recommend that you don't try to use the displacement speed. I think that the consumption speed is a, is a much more useful quantity to use and uh, try to avoid the displacement speed. So let me, let me finish here by a few examples of uh, flames where speeds are a little bit strange. The flame tip of a Bunsen burner, uh, the cusps, that means flames which have a, a local point where curvature is pretty high, and the spherical flame. The, the flame tip is uh, actually a flame which is uh, a bit strange. Uh, you inject fresh gases here, the flame is anchored here, and it has an angle. Okay? You can compute it in many ways. Here we'll use actually the displacement speed. I just want to mention something about moving. This flame is not moving, but the point located here is moving, obviously, okay? because there is a speed here. So when we say that the flame is not moving, it's only meaning that the flame is not moving in this direction, so that W dot N equals zero. Don't believe that the flow is not moving, only the flame. So if you use this property, here you can actually use SD. So you write that W equals U plus SD dot N. That's the definition of SD. And then you project it to find W dot N equals zero. And you will find that the sinus of this angle is equal to SD over U. Again, that's kind of an intuitive idea, OK? If you travel here, the flow is going in this direction at U. The flame is going in this direction at SD, so the sinus must be you know, SD over U. So if, the f if SD is large, the angle will be large. Otherwise, you're good. Now, a word also about the stagnation point flame. We'll talk a lot about stagnation point flame pretty soon. How do you do stagnation point flame? You blow from one side, you have a tube, and you blow against another side. And this side here can contain fresh gases or burned gases. And there will be a zone here where the speed is zero. That's why we call it stagnation. And then the, you can stabilize the flame front in this region. It's an interesting flame because, again, it does not move. But still, if you have two particles here, they will get separated over time. Okay? So the flow is not zero, but the flame speed is zero. Another example of funny behavior, it's the flame tip. That's something I did also with Tarek Echeki a long time ago. He came to me and he said, well, this point here is not moving. Okay? The speed here is very large, like 10 times SL. So the displacement speed of that point must be 10 times SL, which, you know, to first order, it makes sense. But you know, how is it possible? Well, actually, the point is, uh, every time you go, to regions which are very strongly curved, you cannot use displacement speeds anymore. They will tell you something stupid. And we did the computation in those days. And uh, when we looked at the reaction rate, this is the reaction rate here that you see. You see that if you integrate it anywhere, it's always the same, even at the tip. So it's not burning more. It is just that the, the fuel has left to the side here because of curvature. And so in a very strongly curved place, don't talk about displacement speed. It's even so true that the displacement speed can actually become negative. Uh, that's, uh, for those who, I know there are a few in this room who are doing DNS. I'm sure they've seen that. It's a strange thing. So uh, if you look at the consumption speed, you know, either it doesn't burn, so you have zero, or it burns you know, of the order of the laminar flame speed. So you always know what the consumption speed should be. You know? It should be of the order of the laminar flame speed. When you do the same thing for displacement speed, you know, you can have very large values, like in the flame tip here, we had 10. You can even have negative values. So what does that mean? What does a negative displacement speed mean? Well, it's due to the fact that uh, you have places in the flame which can be very curved or which can be unsteady. So for example, here you have a cusp that happens quite often when you use the G equation. And you see that this cusp can go extremely fast. At the last moment where these two things will disappear, you know, in one microsecond, this point will come here. So it will lead to very large values of the flame speed, of the displacement speed. And in a code, for those of you who are using the G equation, it's really painful to handle these moments. You know, numerically, it's tough. The other thing which can happen is that if you have a flame where the thickness is changing, there are certain points 
where you know, the displacement speed is going in the wrong direction. Those are negative events. So this point is propagating left compared to the flow, but this one is actually propagating in the wrong direction. So displacement speed can take negative values. That's a simulation by the Sandia group where you can find Jackie Chen. She was, uh, she was the leader of that group, and she's plotting here SD over SL0, normalized by the laminar flame speed, as a function of curvature. And you see that there are many points where the displacement speed is negative and equal to minus 5 or minus 8 times SL0. So it's physical, but it's just that it doesn't help you to understand combustion. Okay? It's, it's just a pain. Uh, it's a curiosity, again, due to dilatation. So let me finish now with uh, one example, which is really the overarching problem in combustion, that's the spherical flame. This is how st people started the whole show here. You take a premix gas, no velocity, you put a spark, bling, you have a, sph a sphere of burnt gases surrounded by fresh gases. At which speed does this point move? Of course, the intuitive result is to say it's moving at the flame speed. No, that would be too simple. You can do here the same thing I did five minutes ago. You can do mass conservation of CO2. This is a sphere of CO2. So it has a volume of 4 third pi r square. And inside, there is a mass of CO2, which is rho 2 y CO2. And the mass of CO2, which is produced every second, is the surface multiplied by rho 1 as C y CO2. You plug that one here, and you find that dr dt is actually rho 1 over rho 2 multiplied by SC. So again, if you ignite a sphere in a gas where the flame speed is 1 meter per second, it will grow at 7 or 8 meters per second, which is not the same. Okay. And this is what you can observe in the experiments. When you do an experiment, you don't know the flame speed, but you will see dr dt. You just have to measure it versus time. And a big problem that we will discuss uh, after the break is how can you use measurements of DRDT to get SC? Because this is how you obtain it. So if you want to know the flow speed, you do what we did before. You write a conservation equation for the total mass in this box uh, between R equals zero and R equals R, which is a fixed position. And that will give you the gas velocity. And again, that's the same thing as the tube like, uh, we did five minutes ago. There is a blast effect and you find that the velocity of the gas here in the fresh gases is not zero. It's this expression that you can actually simplify, and uh, you obtain the expression which is here. And uh, you see the, the burn gases in the sphere don't move. They cannot go anywhere. But the fresh gases have a velocity like this, and you know, far away from the flame front, there is an expansion velocity of the fresh gases. Basically, the fresh gases are trying to go away, okay? Because of dilatation, you have to, 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 to go away. Okay, um, so to conclude here, uh, we'll come back to the spherical flame in a minute because that's actually one of the, one of the methods to measure flame speeds. And you, you see that the problem is that uh, to do that, uh, the only thing we can really measure in an experiment is DRDT. It's already a difficult quantity. Uh, and from that, we will try to find the flame speed. And you will see that uh, if you read the papers on that, people have been fighting about that for a long, long time because it's a complicated thing to do. It wouldn't be a problem, you know, if it was complicated and that no application. Unfortunately, every time you do combustion, you always need the flame speed at some point. Uh, if you do a complex chemistry computation with Cantera, you find 42 centimeters per second. Someone will ask you, okay, what was the measurement? Well, as you will see in a minute, the measurements are, have a very uh, wide uh, error. And uh, today, uh, predicting the flame speed within, you know, one or two percent is quite difficult. One of the reasons is what I will explain uh, uh, after the break is the difficulty of finding a link between DRDT and, uh, and the flame speed. Okay, um, I want to, I think we can stop here for the break. Uh, we come back in 15 minutes. Uh, is there any, any question on what we said right now? Or comments? Yes? I will, I will show you a movie, actually, after the break. The, the main effect is that um, the more turbulence you have, the faster the flame goes, 
faster the flame goes, the more turbulence you have. And these things accumulate, and they accumulate without limit until the flame moves at the speed of the acoustic waves, then they lock, and then everything goes to detonation, and then it's the end of the world. But uh, uh, if the tube is sufficiently long, the best example, we'll talk about that on Thursday, is mine tubes. You know, when you, when you go in a mine, which has a very long tube, uh, and you start a flame somewhere, it's finished. This thing will go to detonation. And uh, just because there is an, uh, this self-acceleration process has no limit. It's, it's just, uh, it's crazy. That's why H2 is so dangerous. I would say yes, but I'm not sure. Uh, we, would, uh, we need to think about that, yeah. You're talking about what, with a phase change between liquid and a gas or something like this? Yeah, no, you, it works only because the flame is able to generate turbulence ahead of itself. If you cannot do that, then there is no acceleration. No, I'm not talking about the dilution effect and the transition to detonation. Oh, or then oh but yeah, like yeah, okay. You, you, that certain things like solid propellant detonate so well that you don't need this process. They, they just, the energy is so high that uh, they go to detonation very rapidly. Yeah. But it's a different process. Right, but when you don't have a detonation, just have the heat Yeah. I don't know. I would need to think about that. I have no answer for that. Sorry. No, no, because again, the adiabatic flame temperature is T2 minus T1 equal QYF over CP. This is what we call uh, thermochemistry. It does not depend on the speed. At the example I always give, you know, if you're in a train here and you go to New York, you always go to New York if you move. You, you, the, the final destination doesn't change. The chemistry will take you there fast or slowly, but the end destination is the same. You start from T1, you will go to T2, except if you stop on the track. If there is no combustion, then you don't go to T2. If you burn, you go to T2. Even if the diffusivity changes, that diffusivity is like making the trip longer or shorter, but it doesn't change the destination, except for stretch effects, which I will describe later. But uh, to first order, you always go to T2. No other question? So we get a coffee and we'll be back in 15 minutes, something like this. Thank you. So let's, let's continue with these laminar flames. The, the, the one thing I want to say, because some of you asked questions, I think it's important to realize that uh, for many theoreticians, and actually for many people, a laminar premix flame should be infinitely thin. Okay? Many people see that actually as an interface between fresh and burned gases. And if the flame is thin, it makes your life somewhat easier. But when you do a measurement, you find out that the flame is not thin. And if you do a simulation with a resolved simulation, it's not thin. And you might say, oh, well, it's a detail. Well, it's not, actually. It makes your life miserable. Uh, and uh, I will give you a few examples of that now. So this is related to a problem, which Moshe will touch also pretty soon, which is how do you measure flame speed? That's an old problem, actually. And people have been wondering about that for a long time. They were saying, if we want to build a, a, an engine, we would like to know if this fuel is better than this one. In other words, does it burn faster or not? So we need a way to measure flame speed. There are many ways to do that. Today, you have a choice. You could do a computation. Okay. The point that you still have to realize is that when you do a computation, you need a chemical scheme. How was this scheme validated? It was validated versus previous measurements. Okay. So don't believe because you belong to a generation which has chemical schemes, that they were done independently of measurements. Everything was measured. Initially, everything was measured. And the problem is that they were not really well measured. Okay? That's, a, that's a problem. So of course, many of you will do that. You will extrapolate a computation with a chemical scheme that you have, that you get on the web. Don't forget that these things were actually also calibrated. So this problem of measuring flame speed is an old one, and, uh, and uh, you will find hundreds of papers on that. And uh, there are many ways to do that. Okay? I just want to mention here a few of them. And uh, you will see that uh, 
For each of them, there, is a, uh, there, there are problems. Flame speed in a tube. That would look like a very simple way to do it. You take a tube, you fill it with fresh gases, you ignite, and you just look at the flame speed. Except that you don't know the flow speed when you do that, because the flow might leave by the inlet or the outlet, and so you don't, you're not really sure that you're measuring the right speed. But more importantly, those flames usually do not remain planar, because this is an experiment. And in an experiment, you can start seeing instabilities. I just want to show you a, a, a movie here, which was done by a, a guy called CB, who was probably one of the best experimentalists uh, in France for a long time. And he's actually doing a flame propagating in a tube from the top to the bottom, and for different cases. And you will see what, what's happening. So this is a, a propane air flame, and you ignite it on the top. So you see that the first thing which happens is that it's not going you know, well. It's not flat. Now, if you zoom on that, I think it's going to redo it. That was a different occurrence ratio. So it's not flat. You know, it's some, something else is happening. And it's what we will be describing uh, in two days. So you have instabilities. But more importantly, the flame does not remain flat. You know, uh, It develops cells here. Then it will couple to the acoustics of the tube. It will start oscillating. That's the noise that you heard. Interestingly, this oscillation leads to flat flame front for a while. And then after that, it starts making cells. The movie will move now, will bring the flame up. Look at the flame now. Obviously, you cannot use that to measure any speed of a flat front. It's, there are other things happening, OK? Other complicated things of instabilities that you don't want to have. And every time you try to measure flame speeds in a tube, you hit on this problem, OK? So it's not the right device to measure flame speed. The other way to measure flame speed is the spherical flame. So you take a sphere here, but you ignite with a spark, and you look at the growth of the flame front. Now, this is an example of uh, different uh, experiments going from lean to stoichiometric to rich flames here. And uh, you see that you have a small sphere of burn gases growing, and you can measure DRDT. And from that, you can back up SC. Remember, DRDT is rho 1 over rho 2 multiplied by SC, at least to first order. Now, this doesn't work so well also, if you want to be precise. Why? Well, because this model, DRDT equals rho 1, rho 2 over SC, I have derived it assuming that the flame was thin, that the density rho 2 was the density of the burn gases. But these gases may have been cooled because of radiation, they can, you know, they, we, we need a model for them also. That means we need to do a computation. We cannot measure them. Okay, that is just too small. So if we get this number wrong, rho 2, then we will get SC wrong. And uh, okay, that's, it's, it's not going to be a good measurement. DRDT we can have, okay? It's just the speed of growth. But this ratio here is actually quite difficult to have precisely. And, uh, it's, remember also that this is a model for a thin flame where we wrote that the thickness here was zero. We never considered the gases which are trapped here, which is a model. There is a correction actually in the, in the TNC book uh, which shows that uh, you have to take that into account if you want to measure the Markstein number. I'll come back to the Markstein length pretty soon because Moshe will give you a lot of Markstein tomorrow, um, but it's a little bit too early to do that. So we did actually simulations of that. And uh, this is an example of temperature when the flame is here. And you see that the temperature within the burn gases is not homogeneous, so that the density in the burn gases here is not a constant. So by the way, it means that the model, which gives us DRDT equal rho 1 over rho 2 C, is just a model. So if you want to be precise, it's not going to work. So uh, these are the same measurements as a function of time. You see the temperature initially here. And you see that the temperature in the central part of the flame is, remains lower than at the flame front, because the flame itself is changing. And I will have to tell you pretty soon why this flame is changing. So there are advantages, and there are, I would say at least one half of the speed measurements today in this world are done in bombs like this one. I know I, I talked to someone who's doing that, actually, uh, in his PhD today. Huh? Uh, and it's, so it's nice to do that, because one of the things you can do with a bomb is you can do it at high pressure. Knowing the flame speed at one bar is not so interesting. If you do a piston engine, you would like to know 
flame speed at 50 bars, okay? So in a bomb, you can do it. You can do a bomb where the initial pressure is 50 bars, and then you go to 200, uh, and then you can measure flame speed. Unfortunately, the problem in this bomb is that you need to ignite the flames, so the spark is important. Uh, if the bomb is too small, the pressure will go up, and then you are not measuring a constant pressure flame speed. You have to do corrections, which is painful, and it can also become unstable. If a flat flame can become unstable, a spherical flame can also become unstable. That's actually uh, uh, an experiment by my, my old friend, uh, Fokian Egolfopoulos, uh, and you have here uh, a spark igniting a premix gas, and you will see that uh, for this case, it's also doing cells. Okay, look at these nice cells. But obviously, now nothing is a sphere anymore. You cannot do any measurements here, okay? It's a mess. Uh, it's, it's growing, but you cannot use it to measure anything meaningful. Okay? So again, if you want to know the flame speed within one or two percent, you see that it's, it's quite complicated. It's easy to do a dirty computation, but it's not easy to do a clean one. So that when you go, you know, the oldest flame speed everywhere is methane air flame at one bar, 300 K. Everyone's doing it. Okay. There are even people doing convergence studies you know, of the flame speed as a function of time. Uh, because uh, if you look at the papers of 50 years ago, they were not as good as today. And we see that they, they were the spreading of the data was huge. And now they are more or less converged to 38 centimeters per second at stoichiometry, because this is really the key value you know, here. One, one bar, 38 centimeters per second. The problem is that when you try to collect everything, you have a spreading of the data, you know, as you can see here, a little bit over, all over the place, okay? And uh, so if you ask me what the flame speed is at one bar, you know, you will have to say it's 38 centimeters per second plus or minus two or three, or, and, it, and, and it's complicated. And it's not a solved problem. And when you get to rich flames, high pressure, then it doesn't work. So basically, we don't know what the flame speed is. Now, I need to talk about stretch, okay. I don't think we talked about stretch for the moment. We'll talk about it a lot when we talk about uh, turbulent flames. Stretch is a strange quantity. It's a quantity which has a dimension seconds minus one, and it's one over A, D, A, D, T, where A is the flame surface. In combustion, what we see quite often is that if you take one square meter of flame and you put it in a certain flow, it can become two square meters it has been stretched, okay? The speed at which you go from one to two is the flame stretch in seconds minus one. If it is one second, mi one second minus one, it means in one second, I'm going from one square meter to two square meters. Stretch is, is a miracle, okay? Because a, a one square meter of flame is very important for us. The power comes from that. And stretch allows you to take one square meter of powerful flame and to make it two square meters. Imagine you could do that with dollars. You know. Take one, make it two. So I wouldn't be here. So, <laughs> so for, for all our engines, stretch is the key problem. Make more flame surface faster will give you more power. So we define it this way here. And one of the questions is that uh, we would like to compute it, and we would like to make it as large as possible. We feel somehow that there is a small problem with stretching things too fast, that you will break the flame at some point, that means you will quench it. So we know that stretch will be good for you, except that if you stretch things too much, you will break the flame and you will lose everything. So stretch is good, but you have to keep it under certain limits. And of course, Moshe will talk a lot about stretch. So stretch is actually one of the first papers that my advisor told me to do. It's a lot of math, it's not really nice, but uh, you can compute stretch. You put a surface in a flow, and you can prove that stretch comes from two things. There is a first term here which is kind of strange. It's the gradient in the tangent plane. There's a, there's a whole section in my book about that. I don't want to go into the details. It's a dirty problem. But this is what we call the tangent uh, strain in the, in the flame plane. So if, if the flame is here, this measures the way at which you pull on it. Okay? If the speed is going at different values here and there, this thing will increase in size. Okay. That's the first term. The second term is curvature. Curvature is the fact that if you have a sphere, a sphere of flame and you just wait, it will become larger. Okay. Obviously, it's growing. So this is the term here. This is flame curvature. 
And this is the displacement speed, the infamous displacement speed. But it appears, so we have to keep it. So this is train. If you tell me what the flow speed is and where the flame is, I can compute this thing. And those of you who do DNS, you know that this is a big game in DNS to compute all these terms and to do correlations of everything with everything. It's a, it's a big game for, for stretch people. Now, this is an, one of the oldest DNS that we did uh, at Stanford 30 years ago, uh, of stretch in this flame, actually. And this is the PDF of stretch. Okay, we'll talk about PDF also, I hope, before the end of the week. What is a PDF? It's like an histogram. So you take this flame, you go to this point, and you compute flame stretch. Okay, if it is positive, you go here, you put a plus one. If it is negative, you go here, you put a minus, you put one, one bin here. And then you add all of them, and it gives you a shape. This shape gives you the probability of having a certain value. So, for example, the PDF of strain has this shape for many flames, uh, and it is shifted towards the positive values. And that's also a very uh, interesting point, which tells you the following thing. If you put a flame in turbulence, this flame will take all kinds of shape, but when you pull on it, that means when you try to stretch it, it is stable, because this is a stable configuration. The more I pull, the more surface I have. But you can also have the other situation. You can have a negative stretch. If I'm trying to stretch this flame negatively, if I push on it, it will not stay like this. It will go in the other direction. So you can have negative stretch on the surface, but not for a long time, which means statistically you have more positive stretch than negative stretch, which proves that the flame surface, on average, will increase. You put your flame in turbulence, it will be more and more surface. And stretch is the animal which creates that. But stretch is not only for turbulent flames. You can also stretch laminar flames. This one here is stretched. Why is it stretched? Well, because this point here is going in this direction. This one is going in this direction. So the flame is pulled apart. It's constant in size and position, but it is a stretched flame. And this one, of course, is obviously stretched because its surface increases. So if its surface increases, it is stretched. So here, how do you, how do you uh, uh, define stretch? Well, if you do a stagnation point flame, there's an estimate of stretch, which is you know, uh, u1 plus u2, the, the, the modulus of the velocities, divided by d. Why is it that? Well, because this is an estimate of the gradient of velocity in this direction, which must be of the same order in the other direction. So for experimentalists, quite often when they talk about stretch, they just take the exit velocity here plus the exit velocity here divided by the distance between the, 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 the two injectors, except that this is a very approximate definition because if you actually measure the velocity along this line here, in the stagnation point flame, you go, you know, you decrease here and then you increase again and then you go to zero when you reach the stagnation point. And so the whole question is where should you take, you know, du dx? Actually, it's the same thing to define the velocity. I think we had the discussion five minutes ago. Where, where should you measure the flame speed here, the displacement speed, where you have no idea? I mean, it's a, it's a mess. And to, the gradient also is also a mess. So those things are difficult to do. Even numerically, they are difficult to do. The mean value of stretch, of course, would be that, you know, the ve velocity here minus the velocity here divided by that. But, you know, it's uh, mm -hmm. unpleasant. Now, let's talk about the spherical flame. This one is even worse. Spherical flame are very strange uh, because, you know, the surface of a sphere, everyone knows, 4 pi r squared. So 1 over a d a d t is just 2 over r d r d t. Okay? That's simple, okay? Uh, and then the following thing is uh, that if r is equal to what we wrote before, you know, d r d t equals 1 over rho 2 s c, it means that uh, the strain, the stretch, sorry, of a spherical flame is just 2 over t for all flames. That's a magical property, you know? To take any spherical flame, if you give me the age of the flame, I give you the stretch, if this model is right. Okay? But to first order, it's not so bad. That means really that a spherical flame, when it's young, is extremely stretched. You pull on it extremely fast. Because it's such a small kernel growing so fast, it has a huge stretch. And if it has a huge stretch 
uh, it will modify its flame speed. And so this is why we have problems to measure it. We would like it to be constant, but actually it's so stretched that it's not constant. And that's uh, one of the problems in this uh, spherical flame is that the stretch modifies the flame speed initially. And so when, when we use this expression here uh, to try to measure SC by measuring DRDT, you have to realize that there are lots of, lots of things here which actually are not right. One of them is that SC is not SC, it's SC of K. And we don't know the model for that. So uh, there are models to do that, not very good. The one that you will hear tomorrow about is the, the, the Mark thing length. And uh, again, this comes fully from theory. Theoreticians have shown, Matt Alon is actually one of the kings there, uh, that uh, any speed normalized by the laminar flame speed can be expressed as one minus stretch multiplied by uh, a number which is the Mark thing length. This number can be positive or can be negative. And so if you have a model for that, then you can use the experimental data to, to try to, to, to obtain that. But usually you don't know the Mark thing length. That's the problem. The Mark thing length is actually often replaced by the Mark thing number, which is the Mark thing length divided by delta. So it's just the, the ratio of that to the flame thickness that we have defined. Huh? And uh, measuring the Mark thing length is even more difficult than measuring flame thicknesses and flame speed. So there are theoreticians, this is actually, I took that from Moshe's paper, uh, who compute the Mark thing length theoretically for single step reaction, et cetera, et cetera. And they give you the expressions of the Mark thing length, okay? For the displacement speed, there is one Mark thing length depending on what you assume for the diffusivity. You will see that also with Moshe. Every time you change the model for the diffusivity, you change the results. Again, I don't like displacement speed too much. Moshe will talk to you about that. Uh, I'd like to work with uh, consumption speed. Consumption speed, Mark thing lengths are listed here. You see that they are complicated integral. You have seen one of them this morning, actually this guy you've seen this morning. The one thing I would like you to, to see here is that everything is a function of Lewis minus one, which means that all the signs of the Mark thing lengths for consumption speed depend on the Lewis number. And this splits really the world in two. Either the Lewis is small, like for hydrogen, or it is close to unity, like for many other fuels. So let me give you results here coming from Foreman Williams' book. Uh, Foreman Williams' book, uh, I think he wrote it when he was 32. Those of you who have, uh, want to take a look at the book, I mean, if you're close to 32, it, it will give you an idea of uh, how much work is left. Uh, he, he was crazy. I don't know how we could do that. But anyway. Uh, since you are here in the case of Lewis equal unity, you see that the Mark thing less is almost zero. So when a flame has a Lewis close to unity and you stretch it, it a premix flame doesn't actually feel it. You see the consumption speed remains constant for a very long, long time. So you can stretch a Lewis equal one flame and nothing will happen until you go to the non-adiabatic case. And again, Moshe helped me this morning. He has shown you that if you put some heat losses on the flame, at some point you quench it. So you will quench it, but until you quench this flame, you know there's almost no effect of stretch on this flame. Now, if Lewis is less than unity, something strange happening. You stretch the flame, and it, it, the flame likes it, it burns more. So it's a double benefit, you know? It, the, the one dollar bill becomes a two dollar bill. You get two, do, two dollars multiplied by the fact that each dollar is better than the previous one. Of course, if it's not adiabatic, it will quench. But when you stretch it, you get more. When Lewis is more than unity, it's the other way. When you stretch a flame, its consumption speed is going down. Okay? So uh, you see that the, the stretch is actually controlling those flames, stretch and heat losses. And again, the people like Moshe have spent years working on that to do the, the theory of the, of the whole show. OK, I want to stop for premix flames because we have to move. Uh, I want to go now to diffusion flames. We'll come back to premix tomorrow when we do the turbulent cases. So let me say here that uh, what we've done for the moment, we've done the laminar flames here, premix. Now we're going to move to the non-premixed diffusion flames, but still in the laminar regime. OK, they are def very different from premix flames. What we've done uh, this, this afternoon and yesterday, we said we need three things to burn, fuel oxidizer and temperature. And fuel oxidizer, we're going to premix them before we start thinking about it. So mixing was gone because we did it. 
But suppose now we don't do it. Suppose that we are afraid of mixing fuel and air, which would be a good idea not to do. Now we have to look at diffusion flames. Diffusion flames will work differently. We'll inject air and fuel separately, and then they must burn. You can recognize uh, diffusion flames in many places because usually they make a lot of soot. Okay? They, are not, they are not blue, they are yellow. Uh, this is a good example of flame stabilization here. Uh, if you, uh, this guy doesn't know much about combustion theory, but I can tell you that the speed at which he's blowing is controlled. Okay? If he's blowing too slowly, the flame will come back on his lips, and that's not a good idea. So what's the, the baseline point here? Is that now we have a chamber in which we inject fuel and oxidizer with specific concentration and temperatures. They don't have to be equal. If you look at a gas turbine, you inject the air at 700 K and the fuel at 300 K. For a premixed gas, of course, this was not the case because everything was premixed and at the same temperature. Now we have different temperature. Everything will mix here and burn. And this is the other example where theory is actually extremely important. And most approaches here rely on one quantity, which is called the mixture fraction. So we need to describe what the mixture fraction really means. So to do that, mixture fraction is one passive scalar, a special one. So I need first to tell you what is a passive scalar. It's a scalar, so it's not a vector. And why is it passive? It's because it has no source term in its conservation equation. You know, in combustion, the thing which makes our life miserable is source terms, chemistry. When there is no source term, we are so happy, we call them passive scalars. So it's an equation like this one. It's a conservation equation for Z with no, nothing here, no source term. Okay? That's a passive scalar. Uh, now, what is mixture fraction? Oh, before I do that, I need, yeah, I need to introduce something here. Passive scalars have a strange property. In a flow, if you have two passive scalars and they have the same boundary conditions, then they are equal. That's not so intuitive. So I'm just going to do it here. Uh, if you take a passive scalar Z1 and another one Z2, uh, I'm, I'm saying that if they are the same boundary conditions, they would be equal. So why do I say that? Well, I'm just going to consider the difference Z2 minus Z1. I can do it, you know, mathematicians in France, they do it by showing that the norm of Z2 minus Z1 goes to zero. I'm going to do it more simply. Um, if you took, take a look at the passive scalar equation, you can also write it like this. This is the total derivative that uh, Moshe also introduced yesterday. So you see that that really means here is that if you travel with the Lagrangian derivative in the flow, the change of Z that you carry on your back is due to diffusion, right? This is the Z equation. So now, if you assume that Z is the difference between Z2 and Z1, Z has a boundary condition which is zero here. On the side here, everywhere is zero. So you can imagine in this room, that would be as if all the people here on this side, they have Z equals zero on the other side too. And I'm traveling here, so in Lagrangian way. So when I travel and I have Z equal 0.5, then I meet this guy here and he has less than me, 0.3. So by diffusion, I have to give it something. But if I give it to him, because she is always at z equals zero, I mean, she's the boundary condition, so he will have to give it to her too, okay? And you see that if I keep traveling and everyone is traveling and on the boundary, everyone sits at z equals zero, if you wait long enough, everyone will be at zero, okay? Uh, so, of course, you can show it mathematically, but that's exactly what it will show you. If you wait long enough, it will, the only solution is z equals zero. Now, of course, if at the initial time you already have z equals zero, uh, there is no gradient, so it will never change. So if at t equals zero, everything is zero, it will stay equal to zero. So that's a simple demonstration that if you have two passive scalars with same boundary conditions, then they, are, must, they must be the same. Now, what is the mixture fraction? The mixture fraction is one passive scalar which has a special property. It is zero in the oxidizer, and it is one in the fuel, okay? So uh, among all the passive scalars, one of them is special. It is zero in the air and one in the fuel. And uh, everything which have, will be with the same equation, with the same boundary condition, will be equal to the mixture fraction, okay? So now you have to be careful here. I'll come back to that. Uh, you could say there's only one mixture fraction. No, it's not true. There is one mixture fraction for each value of D the diffusion coefficient. Okay. 
because if you change D, and that's a big problem for us in combustion, uh, it, the, it would be a different mixture of fractions. For the moment, we will assume there is only one value of D to keep our life simple. So let's, uh, let's go to, uh, to the derivation now. To do this derivation, we need to assume constant pressure, but we do that all the time, okay? We talk about deflagration. We need to assume, assume E equals CP. All the species have the same CP. Not really true, but uh, we do that all the time. We'll say that all the Lewis numbers are equal to unity, so that there is only one diffusivity. We call it D for the moment. If we have a mixture of uh, hydrogen and kerosene, it will be difficult to say which D we take, okay? Because they change by a factor of six. But never mind. We say there's only one. And we say there's a, a global single step reaction. So that at the end of the day, we'll need only to solve for the fuel, the oxidizer, and the temperature. Remember, for premixed, we had to solve only for temperature and fuel. But everything was mixed. Now that things are not mixed, we need to describe the mixing between fuel and oxidizer. So let's start with something which is a classic here, which is what we call the pure mixing. So it's a combustion chamber where I don't ignite things. I'm injecting air and methane, for example, and I don't put a spark. And I'm wondering if, you know, what, what can I say about the flow field inside this thing? Now, if you write the temperature equation, the oxidizer equation, the fuel equation, you see that since there is no combustion, they are passive scalars. Obviously, there is no combustion. So I could say that there is a link between all this if they would have the same boundary conditions. But for the moment, uh, I haven't done that. But I can compute, I can construct, actually, uh, a passive scalar from Y fuel by dividing by the inlet fuel mass fraction. I can divide the oxidizer mass fraction by normalizing by the inlet mass fraction. And I can normalize temperature by dividing by the inlet fuel temperature minus the inlet oxidizer temperature. And then, if I do that, all my Z here, this one, this one, and this one, they all have the same boundary conditions. So they must be equal. Okay. So if they are equal, I can say that Z1 equals Z2 equals Z3 equal the mixture fraction. Why do I do that? Well, because now if I, if I know that this thing is equal to Z, I can deduce YF from that. I can deduce YO from that. I can deduce temperature from that. And I got what we call the mixing lines. The mixing lines, well, are, this is all intuitive at the beginning again. Be careful. It, it starts simply, but it's not simple in five minutes. So you put here the mixture of fraction, Z1, and temperature will look like this. If you are in the oxidizer, temperature is T0, zero. If you are in the fuel, it's TF0. And same thing for the oxidizer, which goes from Y0 to 0, and Y fuel 0 in the other direction. Those are straight lines. They are called the mixing lines. That means in your combustor, if you are at one point and you give me Z, I can give you temperature, oxidizer, and fuel mass fraction right away. Okay? And it is just a, a, weight, a weighted average, if you want, as a function of Z. Which means that, by the way, uh, you can have a simple interpretation of Z. If you sit in this combustion chamber without combustion at one point, you know, you are here, and you have two inlets, you know that the mass which is here comes either from here or here. It can, there's no other inlet, okay? So if you say that uh, at this point in the chamber, the mass coming from the stream one is M1. The mass coming from stream one as a fuel is M1 multiplied by YF0. This is the definition of the mass fraction. You know that there's a mass coming from stream two, which is M2, so that the total mass here is M1 plus M2, and the fuel mass fraction is nothing else than the mass of fuel divided by the total mass. You see that uh, Z at this point will be YF divided by YF0 will be M1 divided by M1 plus M2, which is probably what you guys would expect from a mixture fraction. The mixture fraction tells you at each point in the flow how much is coming from one compared to how much is coming from two. If Z is close to unity, it means you are close to the fuel injection. If Z is close to zero, you are close to the air injection. And in the middle, Z goes from one to zero continuously. And Z measures the mixing between the fuel and the rest of the flow. Again, only under the assumptions I used, okay? It has to be equal Lewis number, blah, blah. Now, 
z mixture fraction can be local at each point. When you do CFD, you can define the local z. But if you do an experiment, you're going to define the global z. Let me show you an example of global z, which is what we did not do for mixing for premix frames. I told you everything is premixed. I didn't tell you how I was premixing. So this is a mixer. This is a, a chamber where there is no combustion. And at the outlet of this thing, I will put the premix flame. The tube is pretty long, so that mixing is perfect. So here, there will be a flame. Now, in this tube, the mixing lines apply. Okay, So in this tube, there will be a, a mixing between the two flows, so that at this point here, we have a certain z, which I call z global. And this z global will be the flow rate of 1 of fuel divided by the total flow rate. And from this thing, you see there is a link with the equivalence ratio of the premix gases. And I will give you this, uh, this link right away. Depending on z, I can obtain equivalence ratio. Actually, when you go to industry, certain people work with z, and certain people work with phi, equivalence ratio. So let me show you the link between the two. At the outlet here of this tube, the global equivalence ratio is equal to s, the stoichiometric factor, multiplied by the fuel mass fraction divided by the oxidizer mass fraction. The, the fuel mass fraction I know because it's equal to the inlet fuel mass fraction multiplied by z at the outlet here. And the oxidizer I know because it's equal to y or zero multiplied by one minus z. This is the mixing lines. If I plug both of them here, I obtain phi at the outlet of this mixer equal to syf naught divided by y o naught, which are the reference fuel mass fraction and oxidizer mass fraction in the two streams, multiplied by zg over one minus zg. So you see there is a link between the global mixture fraction of the mixer and the global equivalence ratio. But it's not linear. There's a 1 minus zg here. So if you plot the two lines here, you plot equivalence ratio from 0 to infinity. Here I have only fuel, and here I have only air. And 1 is the important value, is the stoichiometric value. And you plot on the same scheme z global, you see it's here. So when, one of, when z equals 0, phi equals 0. So these two 0 are the same. When z goes to 1, phi goes to infinity. So z equals unity corresponds to a mixer where you have injected only fuel. It's not good mixing, OK? But, uh, and there's a special value here. When you are stoichiometric, z must be equal to what we call z stoichiometric. If you replace phi equal 1 here in this expression, you find z stoichiometric, and it's 1 over 1 plus s y f naught divided by y o naught. Okay? This is simple stuff. Huh? The, the no rocket science for the moment. Huh? So you will see that this z stoichiometric will come back in a minute. So that was easy. Let's go to combustion now. So now I'm taking the same chamber, and I'm putting a spark into it, and then it starts burning. So now I have to keep source terms here. Source terms go that way, you know. Uh, this is the fuel reaction rate. This is the oxidizer reaction rate. Every time I burn one kilogram of fuel, I burn S kilogram of oxidizer, and I produce minus Q omega dot F uh, joules for temperature. So these equations here are not really convenient because they are not passive scalars. Okay, they have source terms. No, we don't like that. But what can we do? You see here, all the source terms are proportional to omega dot f. So I can take the first equation, multiply it by s, and subtract it from the second so that the source terms will go away. And I can do the same thing with these two and with these two. I just have to combine the equations and so bring, I would say, new variables. So for example, if I take s y f minus y o, so this is s y f minus y o, <coughs> this term will go away. So I will have a passive scalar. And then, if I just normalize it by the values in the fuel and in the air, I can even make it a mixture fraction. And the expression is written here. It's exactly the same thing I did for mixing. You see that z, this is the passive scalar. And then if you normalize it by its value in the oxidizer divided by the value in the fuel minus the value in the oxidizer, this thing goes from 0 to 1. And this one too, and this one too, which means that they are equal. So exactly like we did for mixing lines, when you go to combustion, you can build passive scalars which are equal. Does that help you? Well, not yet, because it doesn't give you a solution to the problem. 
I'm not interested in having yf minus yo. I want yf and yo. So we'll need to do that here. Uh, and we, to do that, we need one additional assumption, which is the big classic for diffusion flame, and that's the following one. That's the infinity fast chemistry assumption. OK, infinity fast chemistry assumption is always the same. The students listen, and they say, oh, yeah, sure, it's easy. And then 10 minutes later, they say, wait, wait a second. Uh, what's going on exactly? So which is, what is infinitely fast? Infinitely fast supposes that kinetics are occurring much faster than any other physical time scale. Easy. Which means really that in a chamber, if some fuel meets some oxidizer, chemistry will right away proceed and combustion will take place. Which means, this is, this is where it gets tricky, that normally you should never have fuel and oxidizer at the same place at the same time. Because if they are at the same place at the same time, chemistry will burn them right away. So why do I like that? Well, it means in my expressions that either yf will be zero or yo will be zero. And that really means that in this combustor, the world now is split in two. There is a zone where there is no oxidizer. We call it the fuel side. Yf is not zero, but yo is zero. And there is a zone where there is no fuel. We call it the oxidizer side. And at the interface between the two, <clears throat> there is the flame front. Okay? And the flame front sits where there is no fuel and no oxidizer. And this is where students say, come on. There is no fuel and no oxidizer, so how does combustion proceed? That's a good question. We'll go back to it later. But believe me, that's where the flame will be. So you can compute the place where there is no fuel and no oxidizer. You put yf equal yo equal zero, and you find this stoichiometric equal this one. It's the same we found for the mixing lines. Okay, so the flame will be sitting on the interface where z equal to that. Okay? So we know the flame will be there. So when you compute Z, for example, for pure methane burning with pure air, you find that Z is equal to 0 0.055. So it's very close to zero. So again, it's very close to the air side. So if the flame is sitting somewhere, it will be sitting near the airstream, okay? in, a, in a place which is very uh, close to the, the oxidizer side. Now. Once we know that, we can actually proceed. And uh, if we look, for example, at these expressions now, we know that yf and yo cannot be non-zero at the same time. So for example, if I want to sit on one side of the flame front, I will have yf non-zero, yo equals zero, so I can deduce yf. So I will obtain this expression for yf, this expression for yo. This is the fuel side. There is no oxygen. And I can even have temperature. And this is the expression for temperature. I do that on the fuel side. I do that on the, on the oxidizer side. Oxidizer side is just the same thing. There is no fuel. So from this expression, I can deduce the oxidizer and the temperature. And now we put all that in the famous Z diagram. If you work on diffusion flames, you, you, you will live with the Z diagram all the time. The Z diagram works this way now. You put Z as axis here. And these big lines here correspond to the combustion lines. Those correspond to the mixing line. So this, this is the, the oxidizer side. This is the fuel side. You see that uh, on the oxidizer side, there is no fuel. Then the, the wool is this one. Same thing for oxidizer and here for temperature. And you see that the temperature will peak at the stoichiometry. So there is in this burner a zone where Z equals Z stoichiometric and where the temperature is maximum. Okay? And that's a big problem for diffusion flames, is that whatever you do, there will always be a zone where z equals z stoichiometric, obviously, because z goes from 0 to 1. So it has to go through z stoichiometric somewhere. And at this point, it will be extremely hot. And if it is extremely hot, it will be extremely polluting. And for example, it will make NOx. So as soon as you talk about diffusion flames, you know that there will be a stoichiometric zone on this stoichiometric zone, it will be very hot. If it is very hot, it will make a lot of NOx. So in the mind of a lot of people building gas turbines, diffusion flames equal NOx. Okay? So if you have NOx, uh, it's because you made diffusion flames. And if you have devised your system to have diffusion flames, you're stupid. It's just, uh, it's, it's, it won't work. Now, they are, this is for infinity fast chemistry. But of course, for modeling, you can do more sophisticated things. You can say chemistry is not infinitely fast. so. Instead of having these straight lines, 
you can have other lines uh, that you can build from laminar frames, for example. There are all kinds of improvements that we don't need to discuss uh, at the moment. So why did we do all that? You know, say, wait, 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 wait a second. Why, why do you bother us with all these things? Well, because everyone is doing it because there's a big advantage of using Z. Let me, let me tell you what we had to do initially. If you want to compute a diffusion flame, we need to solve all these equations. With source terms, they are painful. I mean, imagine, I mean, it's, a, it's n plus five equations, whatever. But if you use the Z equation, you solve only one equation for this guy without any source term. I mean, it's straightforward. I mean, it's just a, And then, you just, once you have Z as a function of space and time, you just go in the Z diagram, and then you have Y, K, and T, and whatever you want. So in many codes, it's uh, the, the difficulty of the full resolution is 10 times compared to the difficulty of doing that, which is quite a reasonable assumption. So a lot of people use, actually, uh, this uh, approximation. So let me show you how this would work. Actually, even we can do it by hand. If you look at the 1D stagnation point frame in diffusion, so how do you do that? You take a tube and you blow oxidizer. On the other side, you take a tube and you blow oxid uh, fuel. The flame will be sitting here, not far from the stagnation point flame, OK? Uh, this flame will follow this equation, OK, with a source term. And you don't want to worry about it. So you'll say, OK, I'm not going to do that. I will uh, just go through the Z formulation. So you look at the Z equation in this formulation. It's written here. And you know the velocity field here. If you suppose that density is not changing too much, you know that the stagnation point flame flow has this kind of shape. U1, the velocity in this direction is minus A x1, where A is a constant. It's the strain, actually. And U2 equals A x2. You see that this one satisfies du dx1 plus du2 dx2 equals 0. That's continuity. It's actually describing this type of flow. Okay, That's an ethical solution. You plug it here. You derive it a little bit, and you arrive into this equation in z. With the boundary condition z equals 1 here, z equals 0 here. And again, you, you go to your next office where you get someone who knows how to solve ODE. And the guy tells you, ah, OK, uh, this equation, you can just do this change of variable x multiplied by square root of a over 2d, you obtain this equation. And this is the Rf function. Remember that? I'm sure you've done it for heat transfer, because this is the heat equation, actually. So uh, you end up with an analytical solution for z. And the variable psi is given here. It's the distance square root of a over 2d. And then you, you can uh, do the following thing. You know the analytical solution for z. You have the z diagram, and so you can construct everything you want. And the result is given here. This line here is z going from 1 to 0 for a certain value of strain. And then you see you can construct here the oxidizer and the fuel mass fraction, and you can construct the temperature. So of course, this is for an analytical solution. If you do it in a code, you can obtain z by your full resolution. And then just uh, on top of that, you add the z diagram. This is actually a, a, a full simulation for a diffusion flame, which looks pretty close to the ethical solution. You know, it's cold on one side, cold on the other side. There's a maximum uh, of temperature in the middle. And again, this temperature will go to very high levels and lead to problems if we talk about pollutants. OK, now that you know what mixture fraction is, let's list a few useful properties of mixture fraction. The first thing, which is funny, is that mixture fraction, which we defined for diffusion flames, is conserved through a premix flame. I'm going back to <laughs> premix, OK? So you take a premix flame, like the one we studied yesterday. You look at uh, state 1, which is here, and you compute z1, the mixture fraction. It's syf1 minus yo1 plus some constants. Now you go through the flame front. If you go through a premix flame front, the fuel will decrease by an amount delta yf1. But the oxidizer will decrease by an amount delta yf1 multiplied by s. That's the definition of the stoichiometric ratio. If you burn one kilogram of fuel, you burn s kilogram of oxidizer. So now if you compute z2 with these values here, you see that actually these two terms go away. OK? So you are left with z1. So through a premix flame front, the mixture fraction is conserved. 
Okay? It's like two independent things. And that's actually uh, is a, a good way to interpret what's going on in a diffusion flame. In a diffusion flame, you have two states here where you inject the oxidizer and the fuel. The first thing you can imagine doing is you, you, they go into the chamber and they mix for the moment. If they mix, they mix along the mixing line. So somewhere in the middle, depending on where you are, you will find a state where these two states have mixed and haven't burned yet. Now, a little, a little bit later, not too long because chemistry is fast, this thing will burn. When it will burn, it will burn as a premixed mode, and then it will travel along the red line. And it will go from here to here. Okay. It cannot go above it. It's not possible because this is the equilibrium line. You cannot go beyond it, which really means that in, a, in a diffusion flames, there's this triangle of what we call possible states. If you go in an experiment and you measure Z, and you can do it today, huh? uh, you measure Z because you have a good laser system and you measure temperature, you have to be in this triangle. Okay? Because you cannot be here, you cannot be here. You are breaking some you know, enthalpy conservation. You have to be inside this triangle. It could be you know, anywhere, but it has to be there. Now, the other thing we can do is to start <coughs> comparing diffusion and premix flames. I've been blaming diffusion flames for a long time, telling you you should avoid them. So why is it so? Well, it's, uh, it's really due to these high temperatures. Uh, remember, when we talk about this mixer here to do a, a premix flame, um, we were able to control the temperature of the burn gases. The temperature of the burn gases here are controlled by the amount of fuel that we put here, which is by the equivalence ratio. If we have a very lean flame, we can do a very cold flame. You can do a premix flame with a, bur a burn gas temperature of 1500 K, and nowhere will the temperature go beyond 1500, because everything is mixed before, there is no stoichiometric zone, and so the temperature will be very well controlled. So you can have here, at the outlet of a premix system, the wet zone here will be at this temperature, where you have TF0, which is the injection temperature, plus here ZG, which is small. So in this premix flame, first the temperature will be homogeneous in the burn gases, and it can be very low. Unfortunately, if you go to a diffusion flame, that won't be the case. By the way, uh, let me also indicate that for a premix flame, when you will change Z, let me go back here, when you will change the flow rate, for example, you put less fuel, so the flame will be leaner, so the temperature will go down. So if you find that the flame is too hot for you, you can make it you know, colder. Now, if you go to a, a diffusion flame, it's not the same here, because in the diffusion flame, there will always be a place where Z equals Z stoichiometric here because Z goes from zero to one, so you cannot avoid it. So even if you want to make it very lean, because you change the, you change the, the flow rates, you will still always have a very hot zone. And so this hot zone will always go up to Z stoichiometric. And this zone will be always very hot, typically 2300 K. And as I said, because NOx is multiplied by two when temperature goes up by 25 K typically, you can imagine if the temperature is 600 K higher, you will make a lot of NOx. And NOx, again, is it's like cooking. You know, if you overcook your cake, you, can, you cannot decook it later. Okay, it's, it's cooked, it's too hot. So if you have produced NOx, you will keep it. So if you have a diffusion flame, you will be hot locally, and that will be bad. Now, just an exercise I would like to, to point out. Um, how much combustion takes place in a diffusion flame? It's infinitely fast chemistry, we said. That doesn't mean that uh, the global reaction rate is infinitely, is infinite, infinite, okay? It has to be finite. So how do you compute that? Well, let's take a look at the diffusion flame here. So we have the fuel here, the oxidizer on the other side, and I'm asking the question, which is, how much fuel do I burn in the system? Well, you can know that by taking the 1D fuel mass fraction here, and integrating that between XF minus and XF plus. Note that the profiles here have a discontinuity here. The fuel mass fraction does a, a, a local point here where the gradients are not converged, conserved, and then we're going to integrate here and put this point to this one and put that one to this one. 
When we do that, these terms go to zero, these two terms here, because they are continuous. And so when you put the integration to zero, they go away. But not these two. This one here is the integral of a Dirac function. The, the reaction rate is infinite here, so uh, its integral is not zero, even if you integrate on a small zone. And this quantity here is discontinuous, so this term is not zero. And you end up with a very simple uh, equation which tells you that in a diffusion flame, the total amount of fuel which is burned is equal to the gradient of the fuel mass fraction. In other words, it's equal to the flux of fuel which is arriving at the flame. This is why we call them diffusion flames. They are not controlled by chemistry. Chemistry is infinitely fast anyway. They are controlled by the speed at which fuel is arriving. So you can imagine, actually, it's a, I think it's a good way to control that. Uh, if we were in a diffusion flame and this would be the oxidizer side, no, you're just on the wrong place here. Yeah. And this would be the, the fuel side. And he's, so he, he's the flame, okay? So he's infinitely fast. Whatever you bring him, he burns right away, okay? That doesn't, burn, that doesn't mean he's burning everyone. He needs to wait until you bring stuff, okay? That's exactly what this equation is saying. If, here, if you're lazy on the fuel side and you have a small gradient and things are going slowly, you will just wait and say, I'm ready to burn, but uh, I have no one to burn, okay? So the, the overall rate of consumption will be controlled not by him, he's so fast, you know. It will be controlled by you. If you are slow to bring your fuel, nothing will happen. That's why we call it a diffusion flame. That's why they are not good. Because if this gradient is small, uh, it's not going to go very, very rapidly. The other problem also, this guy is fast, so he's producing a lot of CO2. What does he do with the CO2? Well, he has a lot of CO2 here. And so the place is quite busy with the CO2 trying to go away the other way. The CO2 has to go this way while the fuel comes that way. So that's not a good situation. And so that means this flame will be lazy, it will be long, and so that's not good for efficiency. The only way you can improve that is you start blowing, okay? If I sit on this side, you have to start pushing people inside, you know, they will flow faster. That's what we call stretching. If we start pushing the flow in both directions, then the flow rate will increase. And then the compression rate will increase. That's the beauty of the of the sea, right? Uh, so the I just want to mention that this C diagram is a very useful notion, we need to know it, but there are limits to that. Uh, the first one is that we said that all the Lewis numbers were equal. I've shown you that yesterday. The Lewis numbers are not equal. Okay? They are constant, but they are not equal. So it is a difficulty. Uh, and the other difficulty is that uh, uh, the definition of the mission fraction is a controversial uh, problem in our community. Uh, <coughs> there are many ways to define mission fraction. And uh, one of the problems there is that since all species diffuse at different speeds, you cannot really you know, combine them to do mission fraction. And so people said, okay, let's not use mission fraction. We could use, for example, H. You can count the amount of H atoms in a flame, so they are in H2, 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 Scalar, which is true because you do not destroy H, you don't do a nuclear reaction. H cannot disappear or diffusion. But the problem is that you don't know which D diffusion coefficient because none of these guys diffuses at the same speed. So one of the mixture fractions, which is, let's say, not the best, but probably the best compromise, is what you call the bigger mixture fraction, which is a combination of C, H, and O, and this is what you can find in most places. Ultimately, the real problem is that when you plot all the initial fractions as a function of one initial fraction, they don't line on the XY line, and so they do so. So there is not one initial fraction, and so that is the problem, but it's the best problem. Okay, uh, I will just conclude now by producing a final notion, which is scalar dissipation. Again, if you work in the world of chemistry, you talk about stretch. If you work in the world of diffusion, you need to a lot about scalar dissipation. So what is scalar dissipation? Well, scalar dissipation is the dissipation of the scalar. <laughs> so, to take Z, take the gradient of Z, multiply it by itself, 
in each direction, like Rocher said, there's a dz dx1 pair of dz dx2 at the time. And you multiply it by 2 d and this is the scalar distribution. Why does it look like this? It's because if you write the conservation equation for z, you will find that on the uh, right hand side, the field machine. So this quantity here, scalar dissipation, is very useful for diffusion phase. Why? Well, because it does not care about the thin direction. And because it plays almost the same role as stretch. Uh, and actually, if you do a 1D stagnation form flame, you can prove that the scalar dissipation at the flame form is proportional to the flame stretch. So a lot of models use one or the other. And if you look at this uh, thing, you will see that scalar dissipation is the preferred quantity for a lot of people. Now, let me, let me finish here uh, by talking a little bit about the effect of stretch or scalar dissipation on the diffusion rate. If you remember, I told you that this was both the gradient of my f, you can compute that for the stagnation form plane, and this is the expression here. So forget about the normalization, just look at this thing here. This thing is telling you that the reaction rate here is proportional to the square root of a, so that the stretch multiplied by d, diffusion <coughs> condition. So when you stretch a flame, it burns more. Remember we talked about laminar flames for products cases a few minutes ago. I told you it was depending on the Lewis number. But it doesn't change much. When you stretch a products flame, it's almost quite the same. For diffusion flames, when you stretch it, it's changing a lot. And you know that actually. All of you are <coughs> all doing barbecues, okay? If the flame is going too slowly, you blow on it. When you blow on the flame in the barbecue, you have to increase the strain because you want to increase the gradient of white film so that you can burn more and more. And it's actually increasing by a very large amount, you know, because in the barbecue, if you blow on it, you still can know that combustion will accelerate by quite a large number. The interesting thing is that if you come back to our uh, idea here, that this guy was saying he was infinitely fast, you know, if you guys start blowing and bringing more and more and more fuel, at some point, can you will start saying, hey, look, this is going too fast for me. I, I cannot burn on that. So then we will enter another regime where the diffusion flame starts to say, this is too much stuff. You are bringing too much stuff. And then what will happen? Then we crunch. And it's the same actually on the scandal or even on the on the barbecue. It's difficult to do. We have to blow very rapidly. Uh, but uh, what's happening is that the theory is if you give us chemistry, it tells you that the more you blow on it, this is stretch here. The more you burn, but in a real flame, if you blow too much of it, at some point, you catch. This is actually what you do when you have a fire in an oil and well, when you have a big diffusion flame, the way you stop it is an explosive thing. But the explosive is not here to promote combustion, the explosive is there to promote stretch. So that you push the flame away, and then after that, it's quenching. So the quenching, a diffusion flame, is a thing which is not described by the series I told you because it must take into account uh, a non infinity task um, I think I will stop here for the moment. Okay, let me let me finish now the the basics by saying that we have talked about premix flames, perf perfectly premix flames, and we talked about Perfect diffusion flames. Does that cover the whole possibilities? No. There are other flames. I want to talk about other flames, uh, which are actually quite interesting and important. Uh, one of them is what we call triple flame or edge flames, and the other one is partially premixed flames. So, again, that's interesting that students never ask that, but, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a funny description here when we said there are mixing lines, and there's uh, equilibrium lines. So how do we go from one to the other? Okay? Because I said maybe it's a premix flame, but uh, that's a strange view, because when I talk about premix flames, I forgot that five minutes before I said that chemistry was infinitely fast. Normally, there shouldn't be flames like this. So let me uh, try to explain what the view is on how you go from the mixing line to the equilibrium lines. Let me say also that uh, 10 years ago, there were probably five or six different theories on that, and people f were fighting about it. And today, it seems, I believe, that most people agree on that. So we're going to take one configuration, which is the simplest one. A diffusion flame created by a splitter plate where you inject fuel here and oxidizer here. 
And you see that right away here at the lip, normally you have only a mixing state. That means the fuel meets the oxidizer and there is no flame. And later, downstream, there will be a diffusion flame. So this will be on the equilibrium line. This will be on the mixing line. But what happened between the two? Okay, we need something to do that. And the consensus today is to say that this something is the triple flame. So this is one of the pictures taken at Cambridge, I think, uh, 20 years ago, by a guy called Keone. And he produced the first view of a triple flame, which is just a marvelous flame. You know? So this flame here is a triple flame. It has three flames here. This one is the diffusion flame, which ultimately will come here. And it has two branches, a rich premix flame on that side, which eventually disappear, and a lead flame on the other side, which will also disappear. This flame, we studied it actually with DNS at uh, Stanford 20 years ago. You can compute it, and it's a flame which propagates. And it propagates from right to left, and when it moves in this direction and the flow moves in the other direction, it somehow sits there somewhere. And we have what we call a lifted flame. So the lifted flame is a strange flame again because here there is no flame and the flame sits here. It goes to the left at a speed which compensates the flow and so the, the flame sits there. I will show you movies actually tomorrow. So the triple flame today is accepted as the structure that you will find here between this premix zone where you are on the mixing line and the diffusion flames where you will be on the equilibrium line. And you see how you go from that to the other. You go through the premix flame structure. Uh, the premix flame structure is quite important but because it conditions the, the speed limits at which this flame will be able to stabilize or not. So uh, theory, again, is amazing here because you can predict the speed the displacement speed <laughs> yeah, of a triple flame. And you can prove that the displacement speed of a triple flame is the laminar premix speed at stoichiometry multiplied not by rho 1 over rho 2, but by the square root of rho 1 over rho 2. And this is an amazingly simple description that you can find on papers on triple flames. And if you do DNS and you try to do triple flames, you will see that this works extremely well, 5% of accuracy. So the triple flame moves faster than the laminar flame, okay? In a ratio square root of one over rho two, which is usually three or 2.5. And so the, the, this animal is not premixed, it's not diffusion, it's something else. And if you want to do a good model, quite often you will have to worry about the triple flame. And uh, most models don't know much about triple flames. Now let me finish also by partially premixed flames. Uh, in many systems, we said already that the main challenge was to inject things as if they would be in a diffusion mode, but then to premix them very fast so that they would burn in a premixed mode. So the whole game is to build these mixers. That's what we call the injection systems. And normally, for example, in an engine, if the engine is good, when we go inside the chamber, the mixing should be such that the PDF of equivalence ratio should be almost one peak only. If it's really well mixed, it will be one peak. If it's not well mixed, we'll have, you know, tails on each side. If it's not mixed at all, we'll have a PDF over the, all over the place which tells us that it's not mixed. So to, to give you an example here of how we do that, this is the, the, uh, an injection system built in, in, in Germany where we inject the fuel and the air separately, but we hope that between this point here, when we inject the fuel into the air, uh, mixing will be fast enough so that when we reach this zone, everything is premixed. That's what the German call technically premixed. That the difference between technically premixed and perfectly premixed is that perfectly premixed is really premixed. Technically premixed is the best you could do with what you had. So with this system, it's not perfectly premixed. If, we, if you would want to make that perfectly premixed, you would have a bottle here five meters away where you would have, you know, shaken the whole thing. But then you would have a long, long line full of premixed gases and the people in the lab will tell you, no, 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 that's not a good idea. Why is it not a good idea, by the way? Because if, if a flame is here, you can have a flashback and the flame could actually propagate to your bottle and that's called the bomb, okay? So no one wants to do that. So technically premix means you're not crazy. You just mix at the last moment. But when you measure here, this is again German technology, so they measure every species and they can compute Z and they can compute everything. 
And when they plot the PDF, you see that if it would be perfect, perfectly premixed, you would have a peak here. But in the real world, look at the spreading of the mixture fraction, which tells you that you're not premixed. So it really means something we will discuss also later, that the models that we will write now for perfectly premixed frames, when you go to real systems, they may have a problem because the occurrence ratio may not be constant. And that will also be a problem for, for modeling. OK, so let me jump now to what was my initial purpose, because I believe that uh, you should know now uh, enough to go to turbulence. Okay. So now we go to turbulent flames. The nice thing about turbulent flames is that the movies are great. Okay. <laughs> the bad thing about it is that uh, the, the error margins are huge. So, uh, so we moved from laminar premix here to diffusion laminar. So now we move to turbulent premix and uh, maybe diffusion, but may probably not. So um, I want to, to do a lot of things here. First, talk about the phenomenology of turbulent flames. And then I want to do something which is, of course, important for you, is to show how we're going to model those flames. And that's, uh, that's a whole uh, game in itself. Uh, so let me talk first about the differences between laminar and turbulent flames. I will talk about turbulent flame diagrams. That's the big classic stuff for flames in turbulence. The turbulent flame speed, and then we'll talk about averaging. Uh, just a comment here. Uh, I'm talking only about gaseous combustion. If you would do two-phase flames, like, for example, this is a, an example of a turbulent combustion with liquid injection. You can see the droplets here. You can see the temperature, the velocity. It's a different game in itself that you, we didn't touch. But you cannot do two-phase flames if you don't understand gaseous turbulent combustion first. I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to work. Also, I just want to mention that a turbulent flame is not a laminar flame which is pulsated. This is a laminar flame in which we send acoustic waves. And so this flame moves. It's not a turbulent flame. It's just a laminar flame which you are shaking, which is a different problem because there is no turbulence here. There's only acoustic waves and laminar flame fronts. <laughs> so what we want to look at is really turbulent flames. The first thing, the second thing I would want to say about turbulent flames, if you're doing a PhD with me and you come back with a laminar flame computation which is right within 5%, I would say, yeah, probably you can do better, you know. But if you come back with a turbulent flame and you have a 5% accuracy, That'd be great. I mean, normally I would expect more like 50%, you know. Uh, uh, and actually, there are many flames today. We compute them, and we are not sure if the result which says that the flame is ignited is right. The flame may be actually gone, and the code will even not know it. In other words, when you enter the world of turbulence, you have to give up on being precise. Remember what I said yesterday, don't be a perfectionist. When you go to turbulent flames, it's a very dirty business. And you will see today how dirty it can be. But this is what we need to do, OK? Because the problem is that uh, as soon as you feed the flame with a flow which is going fast enough, the flow is turbulent. If the flow is turbulent, the flame becomes turbulent. Uh, when I did my PhD, I told my advisor, I want to do laminar flames only. It's so clean. But he told me, well, we, well, the applications are the lighter and the candle. I mean, how will you get money? I said, OK, I'm doing too much. <laughs> that, that's a good point. Let's go to turbulent. Uh, but still, uh, it's, it's, it's true that laminar flames are better, but there is no application. So just to, to begin, uh, just to remind you, I'm sure you know that the flow in a duct becomes turbulent if the Reynolds number is more than 2,000, something like this. So if you compute the, 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 the Reynolds number in the tube, it's a, it's a function of the flow rate divided by mu divided by d, the diameter. And if the critical value is 2,000, to see that the maximum flow rate which can do in a tube before you get turbulent is this expression. So if you take a tube uh, in the lab, for example, you may be able to do a laminar flow, but it's difficult for most flames. I have listed here a few flames. You know, if you do a laboratory flame with a tube of one centimeter, uh, the critical flow rate is 0.2 grams per second. So if you are beyond 0.2, it will be turbulent. When most labs go, you know, my lab, we go from one, zero to one. So we may be able to do a turbulent flame, a laminar flame, but it's very difficult. You have to be very careful. But then if you go you know, to a, a, a flame where you have a five centimeter tube with reasonable values of flow rates, it will always be turbulent. And of course, in a rocket engine, I mean, uh, to be laminar in a rocket engine, you, you, know, you see it will never happen. So it's, it's clear that in most tubes, the flow will be turbulent, so the flame will be turbulent. 
Now, as I said, precision will be a few percent for a laminar flame and a few hundreds of percent for a turbulent flame. Uh, it's not even clear that we are able to predict the moment where these things quench. I mentioned that already. Uh, the turbulent combustion speed is going to change on a very wide range, you know, from 1 to 20, maybe. <laughs> so we need a model to explain that, and that's due to the turbulent flame interaction. We, we've known that for a long time. If you go back to the, that's a famous book by Lafitte, uh, in those days, the French were the leaders of combustion, so that's a long time ago. Uh, he was doing a bomb. This is a bomb in which you add fans so that you can rotate the flow. And if you rotate the flow, it becomes turbulent. Then you can look at the propagation of the turbulent flame. And he was measuring the time it takes to burn, to reach the maximum pressure, if you want. This is the laminar case. You see that when you are stoichiometric, you go fast. But if you add turbulence by rotating these four fans, it goes even faster. So you see that the speed, the apparent speed at which combustion proceeds, is higher by a factor of two, at least, when you have turbulence than when you don't have turbulence. And that's already the first thing you need to, to, to remember. If you have turbulent flames, they normally go much faster than laminar flames, which is, when you have an engine, pretty good. Okay? You don't want a long flame. You don't want a slow flame. You want something which burns fast. In this case, the flame speed is multiplied by two. Unfortunately, it will not always be two. Okay? It can be 1.5, it can be 20. So the model cannot be increase the flame speed by two. Okay? That would be too simple. Now, what's happening inside the engine? Now we got got great experimentalists. They can do laser sheets through a turbulent flame and show you what's happening. And this is what you see. This is the unburned gases. This is the burned gases. And what you see is a flame which is completely distorted by the turbulence. Okay? So, and by the way, you see that there is more surface. And by the way, if you believe in flamelet, you see that if there is more surface, the amount of fuel which burns per second will be more because there is more surface. And so we, we, we know what the main problem is. We know that our problem is to try to predict this surface, except that once you know the problem, you don't know the solution yet. It's, uh, it's, it's going to be difficult. Now, surface is one element of the problem. We also hope that we have flamelets here. That means that if we know the flame speed of the laminar flame, we hope that the flame speed of this small element here is not too different of that. Because otherwise, we have an additional problem, which is how does the turbulence modify the structure of these flamelets? And we have already enough problems. So uh, that's a simulation of a turbulent flame here by, uh, I think, Elena Oran, Oran and Poludenko, where you see how the flame looks like in a simulation. You see you know, all this uh, wrinkling and interaction with turbulence. And this is what we need to compute. OK, the first thing to say is that turbulence uh, <laughs> in itself is a complicated quantity. We're going to need to define the interaction between flame and turbulence. Turbulence is not universal. Every flow has its own turbulence. But still, we need to do something about it. And uh, if you look at um, different flows, I'm going to show you a few simulations where you can see a turbulent flow inside a chamber. Here, this is a swirl chamber. Turbulence is all these eddies, all these vortices. And you see that for this flow, they really don't look at all like uh, this one here, which is a ramjet, where you see that the vortices seem to be much longer. Or uh, if you look at the Volvo case, which is a premix flame behind a triangle here, you see this kind of uh, behavior of the flow, where, again, uh, obviously, turbulence and the interaction with flame is quite different. The first thing we do in all models for turbulent combustion is to see that turbulence is almost isotropic and homogeneous. Okay. Why do we do that? Well, it's because it's the best we can do for the moment. So we're going to say that turbulence is HIT, homogeneous isotopic turbulence, because we understand HIT. There's a big community working on HIT in the, in the fluid mechanics world. We know quite a few things on that. We know that HIT, uh, for example, depends mainly on the spectrum, which can be parameterized by the integral length scale. That's the largest vortex size that you can have in your turbulence. And what we call the IMS speed, U prime, which is the largest velocity associated to the integral scale. Okay? Now, 
it's even better if you have the spectrum of the turbulent flow, but in most cases, you, you don't have that. So I've shown you already the, the movie here on what uh, uh, turbulence look like. Let's go to uh, uh, a first question, which is, is turbulence isotropic and homogeneous in combustion chambers? Obviously, no. Okay, never. But we still do it. So how do we know it's not uh, homogeneous and isotropic? Because we can simulate it. And for example, here, when you look at this uh, flow here, this is a non-reacting flow. You see that you have vortex shedding behind this uh, obstacle, which is the flame holder. And if you do statistics on that, you find here a uh, comparison between experiment and LES. But most importantly, when you look at the velocity field uh, and at the IMS values, you see that the, the perturbations are not constant. They are not the same in all directions. The U value is not equal to the W value. So it's not isotropic and it's not homogeneous. It's changing everywhere. So uh, turbulence is not doing that, but we'll do it anyway. Because again, we don't know what else we could do. So you have to start by saying that it is HIT. There is a good theoretical reason for that, is that maybe turbulence globally is not HIT, but if you do larger dissimulation, the subgrid turbulence might be a good HIT. Okay, you have big eddies which depend on the chamber, but as you zoom on one cell and you look at the wrinkling in this cell, probably there you can say turbulence is homogeneous and isotropic. But that's a huge assumption and that no one wants to you know, discuss because we already have too many problems. So if you want to summarize uh, what we need to do, it's like a fight. You know, it's a boxing fight between two guys. On one side, you have the turbulence. On the other side, you have the flame. And these two things will meet. And the question, what happens? Uh, the flame will modify the turbulence. The turbulence will modify the flame. Turbulence will modify the flame first because it will increase the flame surface. It will wrinkle it. Okay? It will make it like this. And more flame surface will mean more power. So that's good. But it's good for applications, but for modeling, uh, <laughs> it's complicating. Uh, but don't forget that the flame also modifies the turbulence. As I told you already, the, dynamic, the kinematic viscosity of the burn casters is like 50 times more than the fresh. So if you are a vortex and you're trying to enter the burn casters, when you will be in the burn casters, your Reynolds number will go down by 50. So you will die right away, okay? So the turbulence is modified also by the flame. So it's a two-way interaction problem. So, but it's true also that at the same time, the flame will increase the velocity gradients because it will accelerate the gases. So you see, you increase the viscosity, but you increase the velocity. Which one is going to win? In general, the, the viscosity wins. So you will actually decrease turbulence. So, the first game of a lot of people in this community was to try to guess what the result of this interaction would be. They would say, for example, something obvious. If turbulence is weak, it will not have a lot of influence of the flame on the flame, so it will look like a laminar flame with some wrinkling. Okay, that's enough. I mean, anyone would guess that. The big question is what happens if turbulence is intense? And uh, there, to quantify that, they have said, you know, you just use dimensional analysis, and you would say, there is a ratio of speed between the turbulence and the flame speed. That's the only scales we have. We compare the vortex speed to the flame speed, and we compare the vortex size to the flame thickness. Depending on these two numbers, we'll have different results. So we send turbulence into a flame front, and we look at the result. By the way, you see here how the vorticity is dissipated by the flame front, okay? because the viscosity here is much more. And you can see the reaction rate, the temperature, and all the species here. So we plot the diagram where we put here the characteristic size of turbulence divided by flame thickness and characteristic velocity divided by flame speed. Here we know it's going to be almost a laminar flame. And the big question is what's happening in those domains. And you know, a lot of people have played with that. And, uh, and uh, you have a lot of diagrams. This is one of the diagrams that we built on DNS, which says that uh, in this zone here, there's not a lot of turbulence, so the flames are almost laminar. Here, the turbulence is big, but it is going slowly. So the flame will be a long flame like this, which will still be laminar. We call them wrinkled flamelets. But then when you increase the turbulence, then uh, the turbulence starts to be able to shrink 
to, to, to take the flame apart and make small pieces of flame. And then if you start doing that, you go into what we call coagulated flamelets, and maybe here in what we call distributed reaction zone. The fact that distributed reaction zones exist is still uh, 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 under discussion today, uh, but that's, what, that's why we use these kind of diagrams. Uh, there are many diagrams in the literature, but if you want to do a computation, they don't help you really, okay? If you read all the papers in combustion and flame, you will see a diagram saying, I'm here, okay? And so what? Well, in practice, it doesn't help you much, except to say that maybe uh, you are right to use a flamelet model, but when you are above that here, for example, you don't really know which models you should use. But everyone is doing that. If you write a paper, you will need to do that. Now, turbulent flame speed, that's the other hit. I mean, you get millions, millions of papers on turbulent flame speed. What is the turbulent flame speed? Again, here it's important to understand the, the concept of consumption speed because it's based on that. The idea is the following. You take a box where you have a turbulence plus fresh gases, and here you have a, flames, a turbulent flame, and this turbulent flame eats the flow which is entering here at speed st, uh, uh, let's say, on average, at the right speed. In other words, the turbulent flame speed is the speed at which you must blow at the inlet of this system so that the flame stays here. In other words, the flow rate entering here must be burned inside the flame. Uh, and uh, if you accept that, uh, you can actually write a conservation equation saying that here, through this square, I am entering a flow rate, which is the turbulent flame speed multiplied by A, which is A is the surface of this square. Where does this flow go? It has to burn through the flame surface. The flame surface is a wrinkled surface. It has a surface 80. But the consumption speed all along the surface here is close to the laminar flame speed. It's the consumption speed, SL. So you see that ST is actually 80 over A, and that's what we call the wrinkling. Okay? For a flat flame, it's equal to 1. For a non-flat flame, it goes to more than 1, multiplied by SL. And so this is the basic relation for the turbulent flame speed, is to say it is the laminar flame speed multiplied by the wrinkling. And this is the big number. This is the guy which can go to 10 or 20 because you create a lot of surface. This one, you can improve this model by saying maybe SL is not the flame speed that you really have, and you can modify that to take into account the effects of stretch, for example. Uh, but except for hydrogen, in general, uh, you don't need to do that. Now, if you plot the turbulent flame speed as a function of something, for example, U prime, so here you, you do that in a bomb and you increase the rotation of the fans so that the turbulence is more and more intense. You see that ST will go up and usually you reach a plateau here and then at some point you even stop burning. The most spectacular example of that is piston engines. In a piston engine, uh, if you increase the turbulence, it burns more and more and more and then suddenly boom, it stops. Okay. At very high rotation speed, the turbulence is so intense that it kills the flame. That's the quenching limit here. You have to go very fast to do that. And of course, it depends on the fuel, but it's possible. Now, the problem when you do modeling of that is that you find that there are models all over the place and that, you know, in combustion, you can always tune parameters. That's what every one of us is doing. Uh, but the models, one model which works for one flame usually doesn't work for another one. So in other words, there is no turbulent flame speed. There is a laminar flame speed, 38 centimeters per second for methane air, but there is no turbulent flame speed in general. It depends on everything. It depends on the flame, configuration, injection, whatever. But still, you will see a lot of people telling you that they have a turbulent flame speed. So I don't want to go into the details of, uh, of this part because I think it's, it's uh, not really important. As soon as you know that you shouldn't worry too much about turbulent flame speed, I wouldn't care too much about it. So let me just uh, compare speeds. You know that we, we did the laminar, I'm, I'm jumping a few things that are not needed. Uh, a laminar flame speed, usually at atmospheric pressure and normal temperature, doesn't go beyond three meters per second. Okay? H2, O2, maybe to 10 meters per second. If you go to 100 bar, H2O2 flames might reach 30 meters per second. 
but that's it, okay? For normal kerosene flame, air, uh, gasoline, air, you, you go to 50 centimeters per second. Now, if it goes to turbulent cases, uh, you will be at more than that. You will be, you can go to hundreds of meters per second. And if you go very fast, and we talked about it yesterday, then you can go to detonation, which starts, you know, 1,400 more, like 2,000 meters per second. And turbulent flames will be around that, okay? Turbulent flames will go from zero to uh, a few hundred meters per second. And we, we showed that yesterday, you know, that's the example of a, of a deflagration. This one finishes that. And you've seen detonation yesterday. So let's talk about uh, modeling. At the end of the day, uh, if you're doing a PhD, all these things are just, you know, talk. Uh, when you need to write a code, you need to do something. So what I want to show you now is what is really operating in the codes. So uh, the first thing, and we mentioned that also yesterday, is that we try to average those flows, which means uh, that in many codes, instead of trying to predict the changes of temperature, we predict only the mean values. So we average over time, if you do a gas turbine, we average over cycles if we do uh, uh, a piston engine. Um, for those of you who are doing DNS, there's another way to average. You can average uh, in directions when they are homogeneous. Okay, for example, this box here, statistically, there is no difference between this point, this point, or that one. All of them in the same plane should have the same mean, so we can average in planes. And we do that quite often. Uh, here you have a view of a once computation where you average over time. Obviously, the result does not depend on time because you averaged it. And you have here a view of what an LES would give you at one instant. So just an example here of averaging over space, okay? We would take one plane like this one, make an average in this plane, and plot things as a function of the points where you are. That means the average would depend only on x. x would be this direction. So when we talk about averages, you will see averages over time, averages over cycle, or averages over homogeneous directions. Normally, they should all be the same. In practice, of course, <laughs> it, it, it's not like this. So I just want here to add another thing. When you do averages in ones, you average over time. When you do LES, you filter over space. OK, what's the difference? Averaging over time is obviously taking the average over time. Filtering is different. Filtering in large dissimulation tells you that you take one point and you average over the volume around it. Okay, so when I tell you in my LES that temperature is 1200, it means it's the average temperature in the domain, which is, you know, a few fraction of millimeter around this point. It's been filtered around this point, which means also that this quantity here, which comes from LES, depends on time. It can still change on time. It's a filter over space not a filter over time. So you can, and we will actually do the same thing. When we will produce equations, we'll do either space filtering or time averaging. They look the same formally when we build the equations. Uh, at the end of the day, the models will be different. Okay, let's talk about density. I don't know how many here have done uh, turbulence modeling. If you do turbulence modeling for cold flow, you know what we call Reynolds averages. Reynolds averages are simple. If I want the average of F, I just take an averaging time tau and say one over time integral of zero to tau of F dt. And that gives me what we call the Reynolds average. Unfortunately, Reynolds averages don't work in combustion, again, because of density. So why is it so? Okay. You take the continuity equation. Continuity equation is mass conservation, okay? We want that to be true, and it is true, certainly, for instantaneous equations. But we are not going to solve for instantaneous equations in our code. We want to solve for mean variables. So what do we do? Well, we say that rho is the mean density plus a perturbation. This is a constant value, and this depends on time. If I do once, if I do LES, this is the filtered value, and this will depend on time. Now, I do the same thing for UI, a mean velocity plus a perturbation. I plug these two things here, and then I average the whole equation. A few things will go away, okay? For example, d over dt of rho bar, if I do time averaging, will go away because rho bar is constant. But a few terms will be left. 
And those of you who have done turbulence modeling know where the problems come from. We, we have nonlinear correlations which don't go away. And we have this term which actually stays there. It's the average of rho prime u prime. And it's not zero. The average of rho prime is zero. The average of u prime is zero. But the average of rho prime u prime is not zero. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a simple uh, rule. You can actually see that uh, if you have a, a quantity like that, which is zero on average, obviously you see that f prime square will not be zero. Okay? So the fact that uh, something has a mean which is zero doesn't mean that when you combine it with someone else, with something else, you will have zero. So this is not zero. And you see, when people saw that, uh, that probably 60 years ago, they said, wow, this looks good for this part because this means that the first part of this equation uh, conserves mass for the mean. But if we add a term here, it means that for the mean values, we don't conserve mass. So we could do a computation of an engine where we have one kilogram per second at the inlet and two at the outlet on the mean. You know, so that, that doesn't look good. So of course, it is due to the averaging. Uh, but um, when we saw that a lot of people started saying, no, 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 it doesn't make sense, we should use another type of averaging so that at least we conserve mass. This is where Favre came into the picture, another French guy, old one. And he said, instead of computing the average of f, we're going to compute the average of rho multiplied by f. And that's what we call the Favre averaging. So it's like when you go voting for elections, and if you're heavy, you can vote twice, OK? Because that's what it means, OK? If you are heavy, you multiply your vote by rho, OK? And just to have the right dimension, you scale it by average rho, OK? So if rho is constant, it is Reynolds averaging. But if rho is not constant in the flame, we know that rho will change by a factor of 8, maybe. This is a very different averaging. Okay? It does not give you the same thing as Reynolds. So why would you do that? Well, because there's a nice property of this quantity, is that the mean of rho f is the mean of rho multiplied by the Favre average. And you see that when you use that, it's a very elegant way to start from the mass continuity, and then you average this equation. So here you will obtain rho ui bar. But rho ui bar is just rho bar ui. And bling, you have now a, an average mass continuity equation which conserves mass. So we like it. And I think the community split probably 50 years ago in two parts. One person who tried not to do that, and all the others who said, OK, fine, I'm, I'm using Favre averaging. I don't want to, to worry too much. So everyone today is using that. He's using any code. Everyone is using Favre averaging. No one is using Reynolds averaging anymore. But, OK, you would say, well, well, is it possible? Well, you know, um, uh, it's kind of strange because we have just hidden. If you write what Favre averaging means, it's just rho bar f tilde equal rho bar f Reynolds plus rho prime f prime. So we have hidden that somewhere. We've tried to forget it. You will see that it catches on us anywhere. Um, one question, for example, would be when you do an experiment, what do you measure? Do you measure Favre? Or do you measure Reynolds averages? And experimentalists will have a hard time telling you what they really measure. The, that would be also when you talk about the mean temperature. Uh, is it the mean Favre temperature? Or is it the mean Reynolds temperature? And you will see that this has an impact. Um, again, it wouldn't be a problem, except if the, two Reynolds, if the two averages would be the same, except they are not. So you will see that this leads to two to problems. Um, again, to, to, to get a picture of that, you have to go back to the old guys. Uh, there were three, actually, English guys. I guess they're all English. Uh, Bray, Moss, and Libby. Uh, those guys uh, just looked at theory. They were lucky they didn't have any computer. They didn't, didn't have to lose time doing simulations. They could think about the problem. So they, they, they asked themselves the following question. If I sit here in a premixed flame um, and I plot the reduced temperature as a function of time, what will I see? I will see that sometimes I am in the fresh gases, temperature is zero. And sometimes I am in the burn gases, temperature is one. And in the middle, I have what we call passage times. The passage times are the moment where flames go on me, OK? But we know that if you are in the flamelet regime, the passage times are extremely small because these flamelets are extremely thin. So basically, this signal in the real measurement 
if you have good measurements, will really not look really like this. It will look much more like this, like what we call the telegraphic signal, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And Buemos Libby said, ah, if you allow me to use this signal, I can tell you a lot of things between Favre and Reynolds, because COE now can apply it. So how do you do it? Well, you say, the passage times are very small, so either I have 0 or I have 1. So now I can compute the average of that. So the first thing you do is that uh, you say, for example, what is the average temperature? So you see that the temperature can be 1, and I will call TB the time where temperature is equal to 1, and I will call TU the time when temperature is 0. So you see that the average temperature is TU multiplied by 0 plus TB multiplied by 1 divided by TU plus TB. So it is TB over TU plus TB. So you see that, that if you accept the idea of flamelets in a premixed flame, the average temperature is not really a temperature. It's the probability that you have burned gases where you are sitting. Okay? TB over the total time is the probability of being in the burned gases. And it also tells you a lot of what's happening when you do a, a, a simulation with fluent or something like this. And the simulation tells you that the average temperature is 1600. Well, actually, it's never 1600. Either it is 25 or 2400 or it is 300. And on average, it is 1600. But it is not a real temperature. It's more a probability of being in the burn gases. Because for a premixed flame, remember that the flow really has only two states. Either it's cold, theta equals 0, y equals 1, or it's burnt, theta equals 1, y equals 0. And in the middle, there's the flame sickness, and that's all. So it's really it's a different view on averaging. And you see here that uh, the, this number is the average. But we can do better than that. We can compute now the FAV average. So how do you compute the FAV average? The FAV average is the average of rho theta divided by rho bar. Rho theta, I know, because during the time Tu, I have a density rho u and a temperature zero. And during time Tb, it's Tb rho b multiplied by 1. So if I just plug that here and I compute also the average density, I can make the ratio between the two and I can construct the FAV average of temperature. And you see that the FAV average of temperature, which is written here, can be expressed in this way. The FAV average temperature is the Reynolds average divided by 1 plus tau 1 minus theta, and tau is the density ratio minus 1. So you see that if you have a telegraphic signal, which we really have all the time in any premix flame, the difference between Reynolds average and Favre average is obtained by this formula. Of course, if there is no heat release, no problem. They are equal, okay? This term goes away. But if there is heat release, you, you, have, you have a problem. So if you plot here the Favre average as a function of the Reynolds average, if you are on this line, they are equal. But you see that when you have heat release, like a heat release of 10, for example, you can have a FAV average of 0.2 and a Reynolds average of 0.7. Okay? So, uh, when you will want to compare now experimental data and your LES, you will have to worry about uh, comparing Reynolds or comparing FAV. And that will be, that will be a, a significant problem. Another problem of averaging is what do you really average? Uh, you see, in a premix flame, you have cold gases and burn gases. They don't go at the same speed. We've shown that already. You know that in the fresh gases, when you cross the flame front, you accelerate a lot. Does it make sense to average everything? Not really, you know. Uh, you have to talk here about what we call conditional averaging. You might want to average things in the fresh and average things in the burnt. When you use the BML model, the BML model tells you that if you average everything, it's the average in the fresh multiplied by 1 minus theta plus the average in the burn plus theta. So this is what you call conditional averaging. And this uh, means really that uh, the white line here is the average in the burnt gases, and the black line is the average in the fresh. And you suspect right away that the velocity on average in the white zone is not the same as the average velocity in the black zone. You can average the two in one shot, but it's probably not such a good idea. Okay? 
And some models actually try to average in each phase independently, burnt and fresh. And you can actually write a model for the average velocity in everything. It's 1 minus theta, the average in the fresh, plus theta, the, ma the average in the burnt. OK. We are going to average, and we are going to use Favre average. So how do we do it now? In practice, I'm going to talk only about premixed flames, uh, because the procedure is almost the same. And uh, the averaging, if you want an equation for the average quantity, you need to start from the equation for the instantaneous quantities and average the equation and see what happens. So we do that for uh, once averages, and we expect to have problems with nonlinear terms. Remember, we talked about nonlinearity yesterday. The nice thing about linear terms is that when you average, you obtain the, the same terms with the average values. But if you have products on nonlinearities, then you are in trouble. So for example, the average of alpha theta, if alpha is a constant, is alpha multiplied by the average of theta. That's clear. But for the reaction rate, the average of the reaction rate is not the reaction rate of the average. And that's going to be a major problem. And also, if we have the average of a product, it's not going to be able, uh, equal to the product of the average. And this is going to lead to new terms if in our equations. So we're going to start from the Navier-Stokes equations, and then we're going to try to write equations for the mean. And then for the terms that we cannot close, we're going to need closure models. I'm sure that many of you here have heard about the K-epsilon model. Well, we're going to need to derive the equivalent of the K-epsilon model for combustion. So to, to, to make it simple, we're going to stick to the same approximations we use for laminar flames. We're going to say there's unity Lewis number, a single step reaction. Everything will be done at constant pressure and without heat losses. No, no problem of adiabaticity. Uh, remember, uh, this is the equation I did this morning that Moshe did also. You introduce uh, a reduced variable theta. Sometimes it's called C also. The two are in the community. And you know that we just show that theta plus y equals 1. So we can actually start from only one equation which is this equation for theta. You have the equation for momentum, the equation for mass. All of them are instantaneous. You cannot use them. You cannot solve the problem for instantaneous values. You need to average. So you take these equations, and you put a bar on top of them, and then you do your best. Okay? Um, so you use far averaging, and this is what happens. We did the mass already. The mass is good, because it has no additional term at all. Great. Okay? It's just the same equation. But then when you do momentum, you end up here with this term, rho u prime uh, u prime j. This is the subgrid scale stress term. This is where the Kepsion model would come in. Okay? This model you should know. But then you have the temperature equation, and in the temperature equation, you see two terms which are going to be a problem. Rho u prime theta prime average, strange animal, huh? and the mean reaction rate. And the turbulent combustion community, thousands of us or them, have been working on these two terms for 50 years. Okay? So I'm going to show you how they do it. Uh, and here, <laughs> you will see what dirty means. So let's start by this term here, rho bar u y theta. What is our problem? If you, if you write a code, the variables in your code are the mean temperature and the mean velocity and the mean density. Those are the variables when you define dimension u of blah, blah, blah. This term here, you have no idea what it is. I mean, this is not expressed at all as a function of the variables of your code. So you need to express these terms as a function of something which is a variable in your code, which is the mean temperature, the mean density, the mean whatever. So how do you do it? Well, rho u c prime, you start by looking at you know, how it looks. This is a turbulent flame where you have here the burned gases on average, and here you have the fresh gases. And you're wondering about this term. What does it really mean? This term is zero here, because C is constant and equal to zero. So that's easy. There's no perturbation. And it's also easy here, because here C is equal to 1 everywhere. So there is no perturbation, so it's almost zero. It's also zero. And in the middle, uh, it's not zero. Okay? So, but that doesn't help you much. Um, so you start saying, OK, I need a model. Now, I hope you, get, you, you, keep, you, you are sitting, huh? because this is where it gets interesting. 
people said, we need a model, so what do we know? We know the mean C. So we'd like to express things as a function of C. What is going from zero to something not zero to zero again? Well, the gradient of C is doing that. Okay? Obviously, it's, C is going from zero to one. So this thing behaves like this one somehow. So we just say they're equal. And there's a small problem, which is what, what about the sign? Well, people say, you know, here in this domain, if you have a sudden value of C which is above zero, we probably think it corresponds to a piece of flame coming from the right side, so it must have a U prime negative. So we believe that uh, the product of C prime U prime is a negative one, so that compared to the gradient of C, we should put a minus here. That's a good model. So at least it has the right sign. And if you look at the dimensions, you see that here, to fulfill this equation, you need a turbulent viscosity. And since you're smart and you know it's not going to work, you put a constant here, which is called the turbulent Schmidt number that we're going to tune. And believe it or not, everyone is using this model. Everyone. Okay? I don't know anyone who's not doing it. So let me just elaborate this. Okay? I mean, this is, a, this is a model where you can do the demo this way. You know? If Medor is a black door with four legs, and Rock is a black dog with four legs, then Medor equal Rock. Okay? That's exactly what we did. Okay? Uh, because we said this term is zero in the fresh gas system, the burnt, and it has the dimension which is here, and this one too. So they must be equal. And, but this is exactly what we all do. So why is it easy? Well, because if you replace this term by this one, it actually comes very handily here. It adds to the laminar term. So if you replace this term by this one in the Navier-Stokes equation, you end up with a very simple equation where you have the laminar viscosity plus a turbulent viscosity. And so to code, it's easy. Okay? Uh, the problem is that remember that we use the kinetic theory of gases to, you, to, to build D. You know, we spent a lot of time working on D. And then suddenly we add a model here, new T over Schmidt. And you could say, OK, it's not a big deal if this term is small. But in practice, when you compute it, this term is like 100 compared to 1. So that in many codes, actually, people remove that one. So we just keep this one. In a, in a one's code, this term doesn't play any role. Everything is controlled by new T. So you see right away what I told you. We were extremely precise when we were doing laminar flames. And we are extremely dirty when we start doing turbulent flames. But believe it or not, Everyone is doing it. There is no exception I know where people would not use this model for, for, uh, uh, for uh, a flame uh, or even for a compressible flow. I just want also to point out a political interpretation of all this business. I mean, remember that uh, this term, rho u by theta, comes actually from the left hand side. You know? It comes from the convection term when we expanded it, and it was on the left hand side. Politically, it was, you know, it was agitating the whole flow. And now we moved it to the right-hand side, where it's actually dissipating the excitation. And we even modeled it as a viscous term. You see? So this guy was on the left side making turbulence. Now it's on the right side dissipating turbulence. It's even become a very viscous term. Okay? So we have, there will be a price to pay for that. Because we changed the nature of turbulence here. We have removed the chaotic nature of turbulence and replaced it by uh, a damping term. Um, I think I'm going to stop here for today, just to, to summarize where we are for tomorrow. We now have a model for this term here, but we need to discuss what we do for the average reaction rate, and we'll do that tomorrow. Any question for today? Yeah? Are there any physical arguments to support the equation? There are physical arguments to discard this model. Uh, and uh, there's, I, I will show tomorrow DNS, which show that the model doesn't even give the right sign in many cases, but that's the best we have. And no one else is using anything else. It's just, uh, that's turbulent combustion. I'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay, thank you.